What's up, party people, and welcome to Countdown to Classic. This is a podcast that educates, informs, and gossips about the highly anticipated World of Warcraft Classic. Each week, we discuss the news, hot button issues, and content of the upcoming Classic servers. I'm your host, Josh Corbett, and this is a show where it's not my opinion on World of Warcraft that counts. But yours. If you're new to the show, Countdown to Classic goes through your expert input on everything relating to the upcoming release of World of Warcraft Classic. Today, we've got another smorgasbord of classic topics for you as we go through all the hunter issues on the beta and what the deal is with that class as we move closer to launch date. We hear part one of our epic two-part conversation with vanilla dungeon designer John Stats about the making of Karazhan, which in this part one covers the pre-TBC builds of the famed tower. So keep that in mind when you hear the call fade out a little bit abruptly. That's just part one, and there's more to come next week on that topic. We then have former foes coming together for another account of vanilla raiding history, as we unite former members of Nihilum and Death and Taxes. Then... There's a bit of awesome theory crafting commentary, and we finish up with the lovely Pat Crane of Convert to Raid talking about the classic culture shock that was his time in the beta. Now, I've got a couple of really quick announcements to help some listeners out here, so listen up. Close friend of the show and one of our awesome Discord mods, Palfurus, is looking for some former vanilla pals, and he says the following... Did you play vanilla on the US Bronzebeard realm? Were you in the guild Reckoning? Did you know a lovable asshole named Palfurus? If you answered yes to all of these questions, then hop into the Countdown to Classic Discord and say hi. Palfurus would love to say hi back. So please do reach out to Palfurus if that applies to you. That lovable asshole is great fun to have a drink with, as I can attest to after BlizzCon last year, and he's not really an asshole. Asshole. He's an absolute sweetheart, so do hit him up. And next, if you happen to live in Perth here in Australia, then Big Chase from the Discord would love to hear from you as he's organising a meetup for launch amongst his guild and it's open to other classic fans to join in on the fun. He says the following We're a hardcore guild called Trivial and a Rolling Horde. You don't have to join or be a member to play with us, but if people want to do an all nighter with like minded individuals and get to know us, then that would be awesome. I'm not sure what the plan is with food or anything just yet or the price. I'm just looking at numbers first to see how many people we can get. It will be an all-nighter for 24 hours starting from slightly before launch through to the next day at a land place. So please do contact me. That's big underscore marsh on the Countdown to Classic Discord and I can fill you in. So hit him up everyone in Western Australia and have some fun with that guild. Now with all that done, you all know the drill by now. This is a community-based podcast so if you like what you're hearing join the discord now and keep the conversations going with us all over there follow me on twitter at count to classic with the number two email me at feedback at countdown to and please do be sure to tell a friend about the show everything you'll need is in the show notes for each episode along with the show's patreon link if you'd really like to help keep the show going and show your support there or if subscriptions aren't your thing then you can help keep the lights on at countdown by checking out the show's tip jar over at ko-fi there's also the show's merch store with some great designs over there for t-shirts hoodies coffee mugs etc so be sure to check that link too now with all of that out of the way let's get into it with calling countdown All right, it's time for another countdown to Classic Call, and I'm so happy to be joined today by Zeroed. How are you, mate? I'm good. How are you? I'm really well, and I'm, I'm so happy to have you here. We've just had a little bit of a, a meet and greet off this call before I hit the record button, and I was just mentioning to you, and I'm more than happy to repeat it again. I'm, I'm so happy to have you here because I was 
you know, hanging out the other night playing the beta and, you know, as many of us like to do, I wanted to watch a stream in the background or listen to a stream in the background. Um, and I had happened to cross yours and I'd sort of heard your name around the traps and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll check this guy out and see what's going on. And I had a really, really good time. And, you know, of course, I enjoy a lot of people's streams, but this one in particular, I sort of really, really enjoyed and figured at that point, you know, I'd love to, to chat to this guy on the show. And as I mentioned to you, I did a bit more sort of uh, detective work on you and did some digging and figured out more and more that, holy shit, this guy really actually knows what he's talking about. So a lot of the listeners may recognize your name or, you know, have seen your work through what became a, a, you know, very highly viewed run through Scarlet Monastery recently on the beta as you were part of a five-man crew that tore through that place. You know, people thought maybe uh, you might have been a little bit low level for that area, but your group and in particular your work as a hunter is something that allowed you guys to get through that content. So this call is very much so uh, going to be hunter-centric, but... um the one thing I want to start with, Zeroed, is just talking about that Scarlet Monastery run and your start with the beta. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, just firstly, is Hunter something that's always been your class or is that something that's come up more recently for you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Hunter hasn't always been my class, actually. I began playing WoW when I, like, all the way back in 2005. I was only seven years old at the time, but my dad was into it, so he ended up getting me my own account um, back then. And I started as a warrior, and I was a warrior main throughout most of Reach. I only really mained Hunter starting in uh, Pandaria, but that was pretty much the only expansion that I did that. But that being said, I started playing on Nastarius day one when that came out, and my first class there was a mage that I hit 60 on, but then I was unhappy with it, and I wanted to try like a bunch of different other classes, and eventually I landed on Hunter, and that just ended up being my favorite class, and uh, so for the past five years on private servers, I've been maining Hunter for the most part, and um, I'll get into the Cathedral run now. Um, that was, yeah, level 30, you could say that was uh, a little bit, we were a little bit underleveled for that place at the time. It was very exciting to go in there with Asmin and S-Fand. Um, S-Fand is someone who I've had a lot of connections with. We met on uh, Elysium, which was a pretty popular private server a few years ago, or maybe it was just a couple years ago. That's how I knew him. So he brought me in. He, I raided in his guild. Me and my dad were in his guild um, on Elysium called raid three and uh we went in there i did not expect anything like i wasn't expecting anything going in i wasn't sure if we could do it i knew that hunters were the dps to class to bring to it just because the way that hunters work we don't have glancing blows so that was the only way we can really actually kill anything and as far as the kiting goes i just use the the usual hunter kiting techniques to uh get these trash packs down I've had a lot of practice with that, obviously, like in uh, BWL, for example, on private servers, there's some kiting that needs to be done in there. There's polling, there's um, kiting that needs to be done to finish your Rock Delar quest, like all of these things, um, just like I built an experience in playing Hunter, and I feel like it just came out in that run. And people took a notice to it, yeah. And so shortly after that run, I was being told by people across the internet and on Reddit, like, hey, man, do you stream? You should start streaming all this stuff. And so then I said, you know what? I've been thinking about giving it a shot. And here I am a month later from when I began. And we've got, you know, it's been going good. The stream has been growing. I have a great community. And um, I'm looking forward to the future. Mate, it's definitely, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that you saw that people were taking notice because there were some, you know, nice comments online about your gameplay. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, you get the obligatory comments of people saying like, settle down. It's just Scarlet Monastery. Okay. You know, any hunter could go in there and do this, but, you know, people push back and, and I sort of said, yeah, it still takes, 
you know, whether or not it's mid-level content, it still takes, you know, someone with a bit of skill to handle it with such, you know, aplomb, if you will, like you did. Because it's one thing to just say, oh, you know, just kite things. But, I mean, I can't kite for shit. So, I mean, I know a lot of people say it's relatively easy to pick up. But, you know, you not only were you kiting things easy, <laughs> quite easily, you just seem to obviously know the content and know your role and did it incredibly well. And a lot of people were crediting you in particular with the success of that run. So, um Right. I, 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 sorry, go for it, mate. Um, so I was going to say that um, I've played, obviously I've been playing for a really long time. I played, wow, it's pretty much my life, you know? <laughs> so, um, but the reason, like, I have a lot of practice throughout all different contents of the game. Uh, definitely the dungeons and raids, but also in retail, I'm a big PvPer. Um, I've leveled every class. I've uh, obtained a gladiator in multiple seasons as multiple classes, and I think PvP experience and just like all this private server experience, um, it's it. Yes, some people can say any hunter can do it, but I, it's definitely easy to see, when it comes to hunters, right? It's definitely easier to see the difference between a good hunter and a bad hunter. Mm. Uh, we're often referred to as hunt hard, right? Mm. So there are some things like pet management. Um, you know, stutter stepping with your auto shots, like kiting, that kind of thing. Um, all those things will be able to show people um, like what kind of hunter you're going to be dealing with, I think. Oh, and I definitely agree with that. And it's so obvious with that class. And, you know, in deal in, as I said, in fishing around for comments about some of the things that, that you'd done, you also got the, uh, the sort of countdown to classic seal of approval from regular, uh, guest Ale, who a lot of people respect his opinion on the show. And he contacted me and said, man, zeroed is legit. And, um, so that's why I sort of wanted to have this bleed into another topic as, you know, a lot of us have been talking about, hunters and the beta and you know i tweeted a joke out recently about blizzard with the broken hunters in the game sort of having a bit of a light jab at blizzard's sort of situation with hunters in the beta with the the broken car effectively that they are and i haven't really delved very very deep into this topic yet we've had um our our resident hunter lock has come on the show and talk about how he noticed the feigned death issues during ultra valley weekend but there seems to be a lot you know there was the early auto shot mechanics that everyone was screaming about which i think has been fixed now but you'll be able to talk about that there's feigned death but there seem to be other things as well so you spent a bunch of time with the beta now you're a very experienced hunter why don't you tell us what's going on with hunters in the beta Right, I'd be happy to do that. I've been playing a lot of Hunter um, over the course of the beta, as you were saying, and I've noticed a lot of things, um, broken things or just things that are different from what I'm used to for the class. And as you mentioned, um, early on in the beta, there was an auto shot bug, which has been fixed. It's been completely fixed so far. Um, it did not allow you to fire off auto shots after using a melee attack if you had a quiver or ammo pouch equipped. It was a really strange bug. I tried so many things to try to fix it, but eventually Blizzard uh, came in like a few days later and uh, sent out a patch that, that solved the issue. But the only workaround at the time was to just not use a quiver or an ammo pouch because, well, auto shot is, you know, people joke around about Hunter, but it really is like, the most uh, important thing you can do as a hunter, like it's how you do anything. So um, I'm glad that they managed to get that one fixed quickly, but actually that bug didn't really exist until I think they tried to fix wands for other classes. So it was something that wasn't in at the very start of the beta. It broke at some point when they were trying to fix something else, which is interesting. The other most annoying bug to deal with as a hunter was the pet bug and pets for one, they, had a delay on all of their commands and all of their actions. So you would tell your pet to go and attack something and it would take it about half a second to a second in order for it to respond to do that action. That'd be with following, attacking, um, just any action. And there was another weird bug with it where if your pet wasn't on defensive mode, if it was on passive and you told it to go attack something, it would hit the target once and return to you, <laughs> almost as if the target had died. 
So you had to spam attack and because, and the delay was also part of it. So not only would it hit the target once and then come back to you, there was also a delay for you to tell it to hit it again. So it was pretty much completely broken if you try to control your pet on passive on the passive setting. The only workaround at the time was to have your pet on defensive mode, and only then would it act somewhat like it was supposed to, with the, the delay on action still being there. Now, about uh, less than a week ago, they push they pushed a fix to these pet bugs, and as far as I can tell, today. Um, in the past few days that I've been playing, that bug has been resolved. But there, but pets are just really always kind of interesting. They act kind of stupidly, I guess you could say, uh, on private servers. And pets have just historically been known to wipe groups and all this stuff. So I guess I was expecting some, uh, high, I don't know, some bugs with pets. And uh, I'm glad to see that they've been getting them. There's other bugs. Bugs, like you mentioned, there's a feign death bug in Battlegrounds. So whenever you're in a Battleground, whether it be Warsong Gulch, Arathi Basin, or AV, feign death does not uh, take you out of combat. So this means that um, you can't... uh, Hunters, for those who don't know, you can't trap outside of combat. So what hunters need to do to trap somebody if they're being attacked by a warrior or rogue or just trying to peel anyone off of you is to feign death and then trap them. But if your feign death doesn't work, then you're not going to be able to use trap very effectively. So it was a huge struggle as a hunter in PVP when that isn't working. Um, It's very frustrating because it's pretty much our only way to disengage from melee targets besides scattershot. And even scattershot doesn't last long enough for you to properly reset. So Essentially, a warrior would charge you an AV uh, on the the practice realm for AV, and you would just die. Like, there would be nothing that you could do to peel them off of you. And the overall experience with hunter pets being really bugged, it just led to hunters looking really bad. Because when your pets don't work properly and you're not able to feign death trap, actually, hunter is really bad at that point. All right, well, it sounds like outside of that feign death issue, a lot of the stuff that you talked about may have been past tense. As you say, Blizzard has been actively yeah. getting on the hunters and trying to fix this stuff up. Is there anything else you've noticed, any other little niggles or anything, you know, with hunters that have just been sort of itching at you going, oh, this is a little thing, but I hope they fix it soon? Yeah, so I have noticed a few things like that, visual bugs that are minor and don't really affect gameplay too much, but just the way that um, it it looks when you're playing the class. Uh, There was a bug. I actually am not sure if they fixed it recently or not, but if you had a quiver equipped, so you're using a bow, your two-handed weapon would be your quiver. It's really weird. So you would, if you were using a bow and using like, let's say a two-handed ax and you went to go hit a target with your melee weapon it, it would look as though you, you took your quiver off of your back and just smacked him with your quiver. And <laughs> it's really actually kind of funny. <laughs> um, I don't know if they fixed that visual bug yet, but um, I'll have to go test it on like, uh, I'll have to go like find a bow to equip. I, I, I have another hunter telling me on stream that it's still a bug. The other thing that I noticed that might be a visual bug is flare. Um, flare has this really weird animation on beta where, uh, hold on, just let me press it real quick. It uh, sort of bounces a couple times. It it yeah. It it skips like a rock to wherever it lands. It's really um, so. There's that visual bug. Just really minor things. But also, I'd like to talk about things that people thought were a bug that may not actually be a bug and were in classic. Sure. These are things about the class that are different from how they were on private servers. So the biggest one that everyone's talking about and. Uh, myself included, is that Scattershot shares diminishing returns with Freezing Trap. And for those that are unfamiliar, um, that just basically means that if you use Scattershot and Freezing Trap one after the other, they will be halved in duration. So Scattershot into Trap, the trap would last only around five seconds or so. And if you trap and then scatter someone out of it, that scatter will only last two seconds instead of four. Got it. Now, this is 
a pretty big nerf to Hunter's performance in PvP. Um, mainly in duels, this is a nerf. Um, but outside of duels, maybe it's not of as big of a deal, but it's noticeable for sure. And you had I've been sort of having to retrain myself when it comes to PvP to tell myself, hey, try not to scatter trap, because if you can just feign death trap without having to use scatter, then that's going to be uh, far better than having to do both at the same time. You kind of have to space them out and not really use them together anymore, which is difficult. Um, but that's I think that that's the only one that's different from private servers that I've noticed that's a big change. And so every private server I've ever played on since Nestaurius, uh, those two spells have never um, shared diminishing returns. And so for the longest time playing the beta, I thought that was just a bug. And so I reported it um, along with a lot of other people as well. But it turns out that there may be some video evidence that shows that Freezing Trap and diminish, uh, freezing trap and Scattershot are supposed to share diminishing returns, like old school PvP videos from back in actual classic. Um, are, people are pointing to that and saying, actually, no, this is how it's supposed to be. Many So like all of this stuff combined, all of the bugs, um, this people finding out that uh, our two CC abilities, primary CC abilities are sharing DR with each other, people are sort of coming to the conclusion that Hunter is actually going to be a fairly weak class, um, at least in comparison to how it was on private servers. Or Hunter already has the stigma of being a weaker class in Classic compared to many others, like Mage, Rogue, uh, etc. Just because we have scaling issues and um, we don't really bring a lot to like group play and that kind of thing. Now, it's... Something else I've been wondering about the difference between private servers and what it's going to be like in Classic is now, you'll have to excuse me if I say anything silly because I'm far from a hunter extraordinaire. In fact, I'm far from an anything extraordinaire. But my understanding is what's coming with Classic is that Lupos is not going to have the shadow damage and that effectively the race for Lupos is now rendered obsolete. And now with that being the case, I'm just speaking pets for a, for a moment, I'd love to know sort of it's something that we don't seem to talk about a lot with hunters, even though it's obviously a huge part of the class, um, is pet preference. And and you know, some people might say, well, you know, there's a BIS pet and you just go for that and whatever. But I've always thought there's a little bit more to it than that. However, is with classic, is it pretty much gonna turn into the race for broken tooth? Or is again, is there a little bit more to it? Okay, so I'm glad you asked that, and uh, I'm glad that you pointed out that Lupo, uh, Lupos does not do shadow damage in Classic uh, compared to private servers, because in a patch, I don't know which patch it was, but by 112, pets that had baseline movement speed increases, um, shadow damage, for example, or um, baseline resistances, they were all normalized. So the only difference between pets were their family, which means like their damage... Uh, bonuses like their armor bonuses all of that those are still there attack speed differences those are still there but things like lupos not doing shadow damage is a big change from what people are used to on private servers um that being said if broken if lupos is not the definitive best hunter pet then that leaves uh the other uh sought after hunter pet broken tooth being sort of the one pet that everyone's going to want to have because it has the 1.0 attack speed now, attack speed does not mean that it gains more DPS. It just means it, it hits faster. So let's say a cat with a 1.5 attack speed versus broken tooth, if they're the same level, they'll actually do the same uh, DPS. They'll just do it in a little bit different. But like the reason broken tooth is so sought after uh, is because in PvP, um, the pushback on spells from broken tooth is, well, it's insane. It's very, very good. Um, but as far, but let's just talk about, um, like other hunter pets, like what are they useful for? Cause obviously not everyone is going to be able to have broken tooth for a, at least for a long time. And what are you going to do until you get your hands on? And many people have been saying, and I actually, I agree with the evidence and everything that an owl pet is preferred for leveling because of an ability they have called screech which works pretty much exactly like a warrior's demoralizing shout ability. 
Um, it also does a little bit of damage to its primary target in addition to that. So people say, oh, the owl is the best pet for hunters for leveling because it can maintain threat on multiple targets, allowing you to maybe use multi-shot or what have you. I haven't done a lot of testing with the owl myself, but um, the owl is an interesting pet because it doesn't do as much DPS as a cat would baseline but it has that special screech ability that only owls and birds can can learn. I personally prefer to use a cat pet while leveling because it has the highest DPS output as well as it can use prowl, which is nice as a night elf because it can shadow meld as uh you can shadow meld alongside it so there's a little bit of synergy there. But when it comes to leveling, I think that you can use any pet that you want to use. It's not really the difference isn't really major. Like the difference between a hunter using an owl or using a cat is not going to be that significant in my opinion. You might have some instances where your owl is just going to be taking uh, less damage because of the attack power reduction that it gives to its targets. But um, as far as maintaining AoE threat goes, um, demo shout and like those kinds of things don't generate a lot of threat to begin with, so I'm not sure how effective that really is in practice. Also, it's important to note that the only race where it's convenient to get an owl at level 10 or in the early levels is Night Elf. All the others, like there are not many owls in the game. You have some owls in Teldrassil, and then I think after that you've got owls in Fellwood. So you can imagine it's not going to be very accessible uh, for other races of hunter. Mm. So yeah, owls are important to note. They're, They're considered the best pets for leveling, and they may very well be. I myself am going to stick with uh, a cat pet just because I like uh, just for PvP purposes and um, overall DPS. I like the fact that it can stealth alongside me uh, when I need it to, and that's great. And I just like cats, so you know. <laughs> um, and as you can hear in the background, I do too. As mine is going nuts, people might yeah. not, people might not hear it on the call because I mute my mic when it's happening. You can still hear it, but it won't come up on the call. My cat is going absolutely bonkers in the background yeah. as we discuss cats. But um, mates, uh, anything else? I, I want to move on to some kiting issues. But any final points on pets that you feel the people, the good people, need to know? Yeah. Um, I will just say that you can use whatever pet you want to use uh, for leveling and it will be fine. You won't be gimping yourself by you, by not using an owl or a cat. You can go ahead and use your boar, use your bear if you want to. They may not be the best, but I don't think the difference is going to be, uh, that crazy. I'm not really someone that tells people like to min max all the time because, eh, and in practicality, like the difference is they they aren't they aren't enough to make you want to get a pet that you don't want to use if you know what I'm if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, um real quick, just in oh, your sorry, in your no, sorry, in your Twitch chat, I'm just seeing someone point out, I just wonder whether you whether you agree or disagree. Someone's saying that carrion's essentially the same thing as owls. Is that right? Uh they are they can learn the same ability screech. I think the reason that owls are better than carrion birds is because owls so like I was saying earlier in 112 pets still have um different uh damage bonuses armor bonuses health bonuses that kind of thing so a owl has a has i think a seven percent i may be wrong on the numbers here but has seven percent increased damage whereas a cat has 10 and that sort of thing and a carrion bird has um just less has a uh, lower damage bonus than a owl does something something like that there that's one of the reasons why owls are preferred to carrion birds, but they pretty much are essentially the same thing. Yeah. They do more DPS or a tad bit less tanky. That's okay. what, uh, yeah. Fair enough. Now, mate, the last thing I wanted to touch on is just um, sort of maybe some of the fun you've been having in the beta. As everyone knows, hunters can muck around a little bit with their ability to kite. Um, as I mentioned before, I know a regular on the show, Locked, has been mucking around in the beta, um, you know, tanking, taking a lot of uh, high-level elites around some areas and, and, you know, doing some solo stuff that other classes ordinarily would not be able to do. Any fun, you know, moments or from you already in the beta of taking down some mobs that uh, were a bit difficult or took a long time? Yeah. So just the other day, actually, um, I challenged myself to solo uh, Scarlet Monastery Armory, 
And after three and a half hours, I succeeded. Wow. It was tough, but um, I was able to down the last boss in Armory, Harad, and I ended up getting myself a shiny new Ravager Axe. Nice. And it took me, I think, four attempts on the boss and two full clears of the dungeon because I actually ran out of food and water. And my <laughs> gear was breaking. I was running out of ammo, like all this stuff. And so once I finished that, I mean, that was really, that was really fun. Uh, to challenge, that was a really good challenge for myself. And I wasn't sure going in if I could do it. So I guess I learned a thing or two about the cap- uh, my own class's capabilities. And I wanted to push it further. So the next day, or it might have been two days after that, I went into Scarlet Monastery Cathedral to attempt to solo that dungeon. And I did get a lot farther than I thought I would. But when it... Uh, when it comes to Mograine and uh, White Mane, on the, the phase where they're both out at once, I couldn't manage to pull it off. Um, like, I couldn't kite Mograine and then also be kiting uh, White Mane at the same time because she's ranged. And so eventually she would just be able to take me down. So I would use the terrain in Cathedral, just like how I did back at level 30, um, to kite the mob so that they could never reach me by using, um, like, the stairs and the ledge that are sort of off to the side outside of the chapel. And um, I was really close to being able to do it. Uh, The main problem I ran into in that um, experience was that Mograin has not, he, so everyone knows that if you pull Mograin before you clear the trash, all of the trash in the chapel will pull with the boss. But what I didn't know and what I found out then was that he actually has an aura when he's fighting that calls all uh mobs in the instance over to him uh within like i would say maybe a a 60 to 80 yard range so when i took him outside and i wasn't clearing all the trash outside i was just clearing the trash that i needed to he was aggroing things like from across the entire dungeon over to me which made it pretty much impossible to do I think the main problem there was a respawn timer. If I was able to keep every uh, mob in that dungeon, if I was able to keep them down and pull the boss, then I think it would be doable, but um, I might get in there later and try that again. Uh, As far as other things like kiting goes, that's uh, fun and unique to Hunter to do in beta. You can go over to winter spring or actually anywhere, uh, Burning Steps, uh, Searing Gorge, any of those areas. And you can pretty much solo anything that's uh, up to level 60 if you have the patience for it, just because you can kite endlessly and your auto shots, um, they don't have glancing blows on them. So Hunter has, compared to other classes, you can do a lot of things by yourself that others would not be able to, especially when it comes to content that's... uh, far higher level than what you are uh, supposed to be doing, you know? Fair enough. Now, mate, sorry, I lied. This is my last question because I just realized, obviously, another thing that Ale mentioned and, you know, people can find out if they watch you on stream is that, you, as you mentioned, you've got a lot of background in PvP as well. Um, you are quite an attempt dueler as well. And so we've talked about Hunter PvP on the show before, but I want to get your real quick take on it as well because I just want to ask that perhaps focusing on dueling, um, You know, forgetting what class, and I appreciate that different classes bring different tactics, but as just an all-encompassing kind of thing, is there a way in which you approach dueling? Are are there things that you do that you notice a lot of other hunters don't do in general in duels that you could give as a tip to people? Uh, It's kind of tough because every class that you duel, you have to take a different strategy to. Um, So... There isn't really like a one uh, tip fits all kind of thing, but I can talk a little bit about uh, duels just in general and like what do the do's and don'ts maybe. Um, so tomorrow actually is supposed to be the Alliance duel tournament, which I will be giving a shot at. I'm not really confident that the Hunter class has what it takes to win uh, as opposed to like say a Shadow Priest. I think a Shadow Priest um, is very strong in this level 40 meta. And maybe after that, mage. But I will give it a shot, and I'll see what happens. Um, When it comes to dueling as a hunter, you're actually at a big disadvantage compared to the open world environment. And the reason that is is because hunters have an advantage over other range classes where 
you have a 41 yard range uh, on your your ranged abilities, whereas for other range classes, I think they only get up to, I think, 38 yards, um, maybe even close to 40. But uh, you definitely have the the, far, the furthest reach of all the range classes. So let's just say you were fighting a pre, a shadow priest or a mage or a warlock out in the open world. Facing them head on is something that you probably won't win. Um, but if you play smart and you play way back and you go in max range, viper sting and drain them, drain their mana as much as possible before fully engaging with them, then obviously it's uh, you're going to be at a huge advantage at that point. Now in a dual setting, you're confined to the the dual um, boundaries, uh, which is not a very far uh, range, and so doing things like that is pretty much impossible. Because for you to kite, you need to sort of kite in a circular uh, range. You know what I mean? Because you you can't step out of bounds of the duels. So that goes for kiting melee as well, where it becomes a lot more difficult because eventually they're going to be able to reach you because you need to be kiting in a circle while they can just run at you straight ahead. So that's what makes Hunter weaker in duels than it is in world PVP and even BGs for that matter is that you can't kite people um, endlessly. Eventually somebody is going to reach you and it's how you deal with that. uh, That's going to determine the outcome of the duel. So I guess when it comes to tips is especially now try to refrain from using scattershot and trap at the same time. If you can, do it you should be using feign death trap and just hoping that you know it works and you don't need to use scatter beforehand uh in order to get it off because them sharing diminishing returns now is going to be a big deal in duels um using those two forms of cc at different times is going to help a lot um maintaining distance is a key thing um in playing a hunter in pvp never like if you can get distance, then you should be getting distance. Like melee is a really last resort kind of thing. If you're going up to Raptor Strike or something like that, it's uh, really not preferred. So your play style should just be max range as much as possible. As far as other things go, uh, like Viper Sting is is interesting in duels because at this level, it only drains 616 mana over eight seconds. And eight seconds is a long time in a duel. And when most casters have around, I think, 4K mana pools, it's tough to drain them before they can usually get you down. That uh, usual strategy of draining them before engaging is something that doesn't really work out like how it would in the open world. As far as just general hunter things go, uh, just use good aspect management, like having aspect of the cheetah on and having a cancel macro for that is really useful to have, making sure you know when you're going to take damage and all that kind of thing. Um, using uh, your auto shot correctly, so like stutter stepping your auto shot, like moving in between its cooldown, that kind of thing. These are just general hunter things, not really necessarily something for dueling specifically, but they're tips that may help people when it comes to PvP. Hmm. Mate, thank you so much for all of that. I hope I, I know that there's a lot of hunters out there listening to this, loving these tidbits of information as well, and just sort of a recap of what the class can and can't do. But um, look, best of luck in the dueling tournament tomorrow, and I'll, I'll be sitting around cheering you on. And um, let me give you a chance now, please do plug to all the good people listening. Where can people find you? When can they find you? What can they find on your channel? Yeah, okay, so you guys can find me on uh, twitch.tv slash zeroed TV. That is the name of my channel, zeroed TV, Z-E-R-O-E-D TV, one word. And um, I'll be stream- I stream pretty regularly. I've been taking more time off than when I first started, but we'll be doing things in classic. Uh, I'll probably be trying to do more soloing stuff, um, that kind of thing, so looking forward to that. Um, also, there's a couple, there's just one thing I want to say to people that were thinking about playing Hunter or sure. were thinking it's all doom and gloom uh, because of the state that they're in and beta and all these things is um, Hunter is, I'm confident that Blizzard is going to iron out all these bugs. And I think that Hunter is not going to be a dead class. I think 
the other thing that we didn't really talk about, we weren't really able to get to, but we will probably discuss later perhaps is uh, the leeway mechanic for melee and how oh. people have been really concerned about hunters let's, when it comes to let's that. Let's do it real quick now, mate, because I'm so glad you reminded oh, okay. me because I was literally, I was, <laughs> sure. I was re-listening to the, cause the show covered it last week with North and Ale and they went in depth on the um, melee leeway issue. And I asked the question of them Hey, because obviously a lot of that focus was on um, mages and, you know, caster classes in general getting, you know, fucked up by melee classes. And I said, hey, does this have really big ramifications for other classes outside of, let's say, mage? Like, I asked, does this kind of get rid of the dead zone for hunters or anything? And I wasn't too sure. And the guys answered, but I think getting from getting it from a hunter might be a little bit better. So what's your take on it? So here's here's what I've kind of noticed when it comes to the leeway thing. It is really different from being on private servers trying to kite uh, warriors and rogues um, compared to on classic. They will hit you from a distance that seems absolutely like what? How is that even possible? Really, it's it is kind of frustrating, but there are ways. Like it, it does not kill the class. There are things you can do. Like you can still do your normal things, and you can still be effective in PvP. But it does change it just a little bit. So. Me and Ale were actually uh, hanging out last night, and he was on his Tauren Warrior, and I was on my Hunter. And we were doing a little bit of testing when it comes to Leeway and just the range that he could attack me from. And it actually, it seems to be about 12 yards. When we're both strafing, and he's able to hit me, yeah, from about 12 yards. Um, when I'm standing still, it's not quite the same. Both players need to be moving in order for that uh, max Leeway to be a thing. But he could really easily dance around my trap and hit me. So if I am some if I'm feign death trapping him, but he backs off at just the right moment and it doesn't hit him, he's at that point I could stand directly on my trap and he'll be able to hit me from a, a pretty significant distance and not be in any danger of stepping on that trap. You could do the same thing on private servers, but I feel like the distance for you to dance around the trap was a lot less. Yeah, a lot less on there than it was here. Other things uh, regarding leeway that I've noticed is kind of strange is that uh, our minimum range for range attacks is eight yards, right? Uh, I have noticed it be somewhat off when it comes to like leeway and that kind of uh, in PvP and that experience. I'm not quite sure. Like I'm still figuring it out. But it seems that depending on like if both uh, you and the person that you're fighting is moving or if the person is a, playing a Tauren, your auto shot range is going to be affected by that. So that is something that's a little bit different uh, from what I'm used to on private servers as well. So in general, though, like overall, I would say that... Uh, like melee having this really strong leeway mechanic uh, on classic right now, it is a bit of a, a nerf to hunter, but it's nothing that is super, like it's not drastic enough to where it's going to make your experience a lot worse in PVP. At least in my opinion, I've been able to uh, still take care of warriors and rogues and um, other melee. And it's, it's not too different. It's just, it's a little bit more in their favor now, but Nothing that's going to really change the outcome of a of a uh, a duel or something like that, you know. Okay, real quick, mate. Before I let you go, any big names you've taken down in duels or in PvP in general that would people would get a kick out of hearing? You said anybody that I've taken down. Yeah, any any known well known PvPers oh. that you've claimed the scalps of. Uh, yeah, so I haven't really had uh, much trouble dueling paladins, including Esfand um, and Dracova. I haven't re really had any trouble against Asmund Gold. That was even at the, that was at the level thirty bracket. I think was the last time I dueled him, but still, it shouldn't really be a problem. I was able to sort of deal with uh, Soda Poppin at thirty, but I think at forty, I haven't found a way to beat him. Uh, I think Druids just got a lot of a. Uh, power bump at 40 and i haven't really been able to find a way to uh, take care of him specifically other druids i haven't had a problem with just, just on that the problem if, is sorry if i can just ask just on that because i hear this quite a bit now i know soda's a, a very very accomplished pvp player but yeah you know there is seems to be something in his play style that separates him from the pack and i'm just wondering out of interest what is it that sets him apart that you can you know easily kick ass with other druids but it's something that soda does that makes you go like oh fuck i can't beat this guy 
I think the problem that I was running into when I was facing him the couple times that I did was that, um, well, first off, there's some dual tournament rules that make it harder for Hunter. Like the fact that if you're a stealth class, you're guaranteed the opener. So, you know, he gets that free opener on me. I can't use track hidden and like scatter him before he reaches me, which is what I would usually do, do in any other scenario. But I have to just tell myself not to do something like that. So I guarantee him the opener and he's really good at dancing around the fame death trap. And he also like uses all forms. So he uses bear cat, like he opens with cat, gets some bleeds up, goes into caster form, dots me up with uh, moonfire and insect swarm. He goes into bear for like uh, other times when he expects me to be able to deal some damage. And he just uses um, all of those skills like pretty much perfectly NS heals himself at the exact right time. Like all this stuff makes it really difficult for me to take him out because he's constantly dancing in my dead zone. And there's just not really like the way that he plays it is just how you play it correctly. And Druid is a very complicated class in PVP to master. So that's probably part of the reason he's the only Druid that I've, I've struggled with on beta. And that being said, there's not a lot of Druid players in Classic. It's one of, I think, if not the least played class, one of the least played classes um, in Classic. And um, it's hard, like, especially as an Alliance player on beta, pretty much, I would say, like, 90% of the PvPers are playing Horde. And so finding duels and being able to practice as alliance um has been very difficult i haven't actually had a lot of duels compared to a lot of guys on horde who were out there outside of orgamar dueling all the time we just there's nobody ever dueling outside iron forge so it's just difficult for me to have that practice and i think even if i was able to have more people on alliance that were interested in practicing dueling um they wouldn't have nearly the experience that those other guys would like soda or just like some of the pew peers that are playing on horde side right now but as far as uh the dueling tournament goes tomorrow i i this is sort of my prediction i predict that a shadow priest will be the winner of the of the tournament overall because i feel like they're the strongest duelist in the 40 meta at the moment but I just don't know who that Shadow Priest is on Alliance. So that is just, it's it's interesting. So there's that prediction. And then also, if that's not the case, I have a feeling that Mages 2 uh, will be either the runner-up or if there is no Shadow Priest on Alliance that is going to be able to do it, then possibly a Mage. And then the third thing I'll say on that is that anybody that's from the Guild Apes uh, who you may know were like really hardcore players on the private server scene yep. that are on beta, I think are going to have a really good chance at winning that tournament. Um, as for myself, I haven't really found a sure way to beat every Shadow Priest on beta. I have beat a few, but the, I think the Alliance tournament is going to come down to somebody who maybe we don't know very well. Uh, might end up being the winner because I can think of all these names of players on Horde side on beta, but on Alliance side, I'm coming up with blanks. I'm not really sure who it will be. I think it's like a lot. I don't know. How should I say it? I think there's just going to be like a lot more chances for people who are uh, maybe not as well known mm, yep. for them to win. The door's wide open. Now, exactly. Mate, uh, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm so sorry. I've taken up, you know, twice the amount of time that I said I would, but only because you were doing so well and I found you to be such an interesting guest, mate. I'll have to get you back on the show sometime if you're ever up for it. But once again, people, please do let me really double down on what I said earlier in this call. Please do go and check out Zeroed over at Twitch. Um, I really, really enjoyed his stream the other day. I'll be watching more of him moving forward. And, um, you know, as you've heard through this call, I just find him to be really, uh, you know, a friendly, engaging character who, as we say on the show, clearly knows his shit. So, Zero, thanks so much again for being on the show, mate. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been great. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you again sometime. This week on my other podcast, The Cinephiles, we cover 2000's The Beach. The very end of the film is so at odds when she like sends around the photo like oh, were they the days? Really good times, and, he, and he's just like 
Yeah. Remember? They were good good times. (laughs) I shoved a bamboo rod through a... I killed a guy. A farmer, (laughs) and I killed a man. That was a good... Put that on the website. Hey, Richard. How was your backpacking trip? (laughs) It's your mom. How was it? Did you kill anyone? (laughs) If you'd like to hear more from the Cinephiles, then please do log on to Cinephiles.com. That's S-I-N-N-E-R-F-I-L-E-S. Or search for the Cinephiles on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. But now, let's get back to Countdown. All right, it's time for another countdown to classic John Stats special interview. John, how are you, mate? Welcome back. Uh, thank you for having me. It's good to be back. Uh, love this. It's. I'm so glad you're enjoying the chats, mate. It's. Uh, we've got quite the doozy lined up for you today because this is one that a lot of people have been waiting for. So no pressure, but it's. It should be a lot of fun. But obviously, as you all know, John is here also. Um, as the author of the wonderful um, book, The Wow Diary. And I really, again, recommend that you all go pick up a copy. I know a number of listeners are still uh, waiting on getting their copy and uh, the recommendations have all been glowing. And John, in that book, you mentioned that, you know, there was quite a bit of, and there is quite a bit of chat about Karazhan. And we're going to go into that in this interview, you know, the number of times that the dungeon was scrapped and remade. What I'd ask right. is... Can you think of anything else? Because it sounds like a rather painful experience with Karazan, and a lot was learnt from from what you did there. But is there anything that was like ranked number two on the pain scale, or anything that was really also redone a number of times that became quite an arduous task to produce in the game? Well, it depends on who you ask. I mean, if you ask me, I would probably say on Karash was one of the more painful ones because I kind of painted myself into a corner. It being one of the first dungeons, uh, we didn't have any idea of a raid size. And it was just I before I knew how to build geometry on Karash uh, was my pain point. Um, Ho- Jose uh, built, um, I'm sorry, not Jose, uh Brian Morris Rowe, who's a texture artist, decided to build his own dungeon. And he had never meshed out a dungeon before. Uh, he painted uh, a lot of the textures uh, for the dungeon as well. But uh, Moradon was done by a texture artist. And he learned the painful way that when you build rooms, you also have to fill them with stuff. And so uh, that was a big pain point for a lot of the art team filling up with uh props so there are so many ways that a, a, a an art asset can can fail that uh or become painful that's a really hard one it depends on who you ask mm-hmm. really and definitely obviously people will find the ups and downs um and you know well, the trials and tribulations that you guys went through in making the game all in the book but guys we're here to talk about karazan today um and as john has mentioned to me this is a very meaty subject this could well go over into two parts i don't know how long this one is going to last it's got a lot to talk about it could be an hour it could be two hours let's just see how we go and joining us on this epic chat we uh, have got some fantastic listeners and i just want to welcome the guys one by one norfair it's so great to finally uh be able to speak to you on the show how are you mate thanks for having me i'm doing pretty good very good and nostalgia dad welcome back hey guys and oki sooner another first timer how are you mate uh, I'm doing good. Rushed home from work for this. <laughs> uh, I'm very, very glad. You and Nostalgia Dad were uh, sweating bullets, wondering if you could get in or not. And I'm so glad that you guys were able to make it and uh, join John on this fantastic trip uh, through the Tower of Karazan. Now, as many people might be aware, some might not, but John, we'll, we'll start sort of at the first step, obviously. But when I say the first step, I mean Karazan, as I've already alluded, went through a number of iterations um, through the design process. If people aren't aware, there was a version of Karazan in the alpha. You obviously then went on to uh, further work on it, and there was a version in the game in vanilla but people weren't supposed to access it. Now, there were some nifty tricks about that that we'll talk about later. But then the third version was what came to be in the Burning Crusade. So you guys built it up, you tore it down, and you built it again a number of times. And 
That's why this is going to be such a long chat. There's a lot to go through with how Karazhan came to be in its fi- final version. So, John, let's start at the outset. What do you recall the chatter being around the office about Karazhan uh, in, in, you know, obviously pre-launch leading up to Alpha? Wow. Um, Karazhan was actually the first dungeon ever built uh, for World of Warcraft. Uh, Karazhan and Tol Barad were actually two uh, dungeons we were doing when we were actually using BSP editors. And with a BSP editor, it's kind of like you're building dungeons uh, with Lego blocks. That's that's probably the best way to describe it, where they don't actually uh, lock together, but they slide together. And the textures do not align on, well, boy, it's hard to describe. The textures are mapped to world coordinates. So if you picked a block and you slid it, the texture would be static, but... Uh, it would slide along the block as you move it around. So it's, it's a weird way to work, but uh, that's how uh, first person shooters were made in the uh, 1990s. And so we figured, well, they must know something that we don't. So we stay with, that's a lot of, a lot of our mistakes. I go over in the book, a lot of those mistakes we made were based on uh, what everybody was doing, what the industry was doing, how they solved problems and we learned that BSP editors were just uh, way too uh, inefficient. Um, but yeah, I built, I, I spent six months working on Karazhan, uh, and it never, you couldn't even load it into the WoW engine. It was, uh, you couldn't load it into the Quake engine. We, we started building our stuff in, uh, uh, using Quake 3. We would look at our maps running around with a rocket launcher and, you know, BFG. And we would look at our, you know, gold mines and caves uh, with with that because the WoW engine hadn't supported 3D geometry yet uh, for interiors. So we we were just working blind. I was working blind. I'd never seen the file in game, which is a huge, huge risk. Uh, it's a terrible way to work, but the reason why we started on such a big dungeon is we needed to define what the design space was, uh, what was the best case and the worst case scenario for dungeons, and Karazhan we knew was going to be this high pinnacle uber dungeon. We had a really solid concept on it. Actually, the concept completely changed um, from what uh, everybody else has seen, um, and that's what I was building because we wanted to know we wanted our engine to be able to run the worst case scenario, obviously. And uh, we learned that it couldn't. So after six months, we scra- I scrapped all the geometry. And when I say six months, we're talking probably six, definitely six days a week, probably, tw- uh, let's see, what, let's see, about nine to around midnight, uh, maybe one or two in the morning. Uh, doing that six days a week and then, you know, only an eight hour day on the seventh day a week. Doing that for six months and then scrapping it all was my first <laughs> encounter with Karazhan. So no one's even seen that part yet. Then, uh, then the thing that people saw, the, the, I forget, um, did, did they, did they hack into the to the game to see the second version of Karazhan? Well, I can't remember. We will definitely touch on that because, in my understanding, all the versions have now been explored. I mean, obviously the Burning Crusade version, no. but there are videos. They well, the version. Well, the there's first one. It was the alpha version. You mean? Well, I don't know what you mean by the alpha version. Uh, you mean the alpha? The, well, the alpha testing was the one that looked like a stack of pizza boxes. Okay. Um, that's that's how somebody uh, described it. It was a giant uh, where you were like a, you're almost like a mouse running around. That was kind of like what the second version was. Okay, and people have been able version. to see that one. The yeah, the, that's the one, the one that you're that describing. That's yeah. the one people think is the first one, but no, that's the second. No, that's that's the second. Yeah. The first one was six months. It couldn't be loaded in any engine. It was. They wanted a worst case scenario. I said, "Okay, this is what the uh, the concept was. And the concept was, oh, geez, we had three wings of the tower. We had the library wing. We had the 
uh, astronomy wing where there was a big orrery at the top. And then we had the magic wing. Mm. And, you know, it was the, the big bad in that one was a giant. Malganus was the demon who has he was squatting in on the tower. And I think Malganus moved somewhere else. I forget where he went, but that was the whole concept. Mm. And we were locked down with that concept. And that's why we went with Karazhan because Metzen was so solid on that concept of this demon just squatting around in the uh, uh, Karazhan. He had taken residence there. Mm. So that never, you guys never even <laughs> saw that one. Yeah. So you guys saw the second version. John, what I'll do is I'll just send you a link now in Discord. You will have just seen that pop up. Have a quick look at that, and I'll edit this part so it's a smooth transition. But if you have a look at that, and particularly maybe around you know the eight and a half minute mark, you'll see what the final boss room looks like and everything. Let's just confirm which version is which and, and which we're talking about here. Okay, yeah, you're definitely looking at the second version. Okay. This was uh, built by uh, Jose... Uh... Yeah, Jose built this, and um, yeah, this was kind of funny. They built it, and this is, again, he built this without any idea of what gameplay uh, was for the game. Uh, we had no examples to show the designers, and like the, the room where it's a big spiral going up, uh, you can't really play, you know, uh, vertical surfaces aren't very good for combat in WoW. You need a lot of horizontal planes. So uh, the the designer said, Jose, can you make it way bigger? We need it way bigger. And he incrementally made it bigger. But once it's textured and everything, it's really hard to hmm. uh, something, you know. So what he did is, <laughs> I can't believe he even did this. He just took the entire thing and he just did a uniform scale and just scaled it up. So that people, their head came up to like a table. Like, like you were like walking around a giant's house. Mm. <laughs> that's that's what how how his solution. Like the stairs, you'd have to jump up the stairs to go right. up the stairs. Okay, so and just for people's reference, obviously, if you're wondering which video I've just shown John, that was Haven's exploration of what he titles as the alpha version of. Karazan. So obviously John is saying that there was actually one before this that maybe we have not been privy to uh, up to this point. So John, that's interesting to know. Now, when you look at, at uh, and guys, I'll throw it to you in, in just one second and we'll go through some listener questions. But my last one for you, John, is you talked about um, the difference in look of, you know, the various iterations and already you've touched on, you know, the first design being quite different. Now, even looking at that that video that I've just sent you, that what we call the alpha version, it's quite obvious that a lot changed in just the, you know, ambience, the aesthetics, the general approach to how Karazan is presented to us. You know, obviously in its final version, it's an incredibly opulent, relatively not bright, but colorful instance. And in that alpha version, it's very gray drab grim and foreboding um is that again your mindset changing over the, and and aaron's your your mindset's changing over the design process or do you get directions on hey like jazz it up a bit <laughs> no actually that's kind of funny that you say that uh aaron and i have almost a lot of say over everything except that uh that's all the texture artists um yeah, it's kind of funny. As I'm looking at that, I can see there's a big telescope that survived uh, part of the astronomy wing um, from from the very first version. But no, like the, the gray drab stuff, uh, first of all, it's not lit. So that's what a, an unlit dungeon, it's, it's all brightly lit. Uh, so basically, like everything's fully bright. So uh, you can't, there's no colored text, uh, colored lights over anything. And when you put props in a dungeon, it 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 becomes a lot more lush. It become, it comes. I mean, you just put a a, a a rug in the room, and it looks just so much better. Um, now, obviously, yes, the, the 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 version that everybody knows. First of all, Karazhan I saw was voted number one dungeon of all time in an in just for the flavor of it, but it was by far the most uh, resources that were poured into it. Like usually you will get a one level designer, 
working on a dungeon, meshing it out, uh, usually reusing textures and reusing props. To have actually custom-made props made for any dungeon is it's it's actually pretty uh it's a luxury so you use whatever's available to you that's the standard dungeon this had i had done the layout for the current version of karazhan uh from four to the ceiling and while i was working on the exterior aaron keller who was sitting next to me he said you know what i can flesh out the interior and you know if the layout's already done you know i don't i, I can just rock and roll and yeah, I, I, I think I, 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 can't, I thought I started on the stables, um, but maybe actually maybe Aaron just built the stables, but he liked working on it. He really enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, so I had it all designed and he fleshed out the interior. We had, oh gosh, we had Jimmy Lowe, Brian Morrisro, and um, I think there, yeah, we had multiple artists doing concepts for the exterior. We had multiple artists painting text. No, Matt McCarsky did all the textures for the interior. That's right. And then lots and lots of custom props. So it's ridiculous how much. And it's because we worked on that after uh, WoW had shipped. Actually, no, we, I started that before WoW had shipped. But everyone else was finishing the game. Uh, so Aaron and I, Aaron had more, all the Aaron keller sections were cut he had flooded tunnels and he had a we had a whole dungeon uh, of subterranean flooded levels because we really hadn't done a lot of uh dungeons with flooded areas and we kind of wanted to do that in a like a architectural mm -hmm. setting um so he had all these ideas with with flooded sub levels and oh I mean, it was just ridiculous but we were doing this while WoW was first launching. Okay, this was what I, what we were working on day to day in December 2004, uh, from May, probably December to May. So, and then we had tons of, you know, people working on it. But, uh, yeah, this, like, you're seeing the first pass of a dungeon right now. Okay. This is not a finished dungeon at all. No worries. Now, guys, I'm going to open it up to the floor between the three of you. And again, just focusing on this first step of the journey with, um, you know, the builds, uh, in, in the alpha or, you know, even as John's saying, his first design, his second design. Have you guys seen these videos and do you have any questions resulting from what you've seen? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right, Norfair and Nostalgia Dad. We'll start with Norfair, and then we'll get to you, Nostalgia Dad. Before you had said that the you were always getting told it was no dungeon was too big. Right. Yeah. Definitely. It, it, it's before we really tested instanced dungeons, we were afraid of people grinding through content, and we knew we could always just put more mobs into the dungeon. So we had to have a dungeon big enough to put more and more mobs. So that was kind of the fear. And this is, again, before we had studied how long does it take to play through a dungeon? What's the behavior around an instanced dungeon? Uh, we didn't know anything while we were building, you know, these... Like even while we were building Carathon, uh, to end of two thousand four, while we shipping, none of the interior uh, level designers had a character. First of all, because the dungeons hadn't leveled up. Like for a long time, we didn't have any mid level dungeons, and you know, at the time we were, I at least I can't remember what the max. Yeah, no, Alpha went up to sixty. Uh, uh, the beta went up to sixty, but. For the interior level designers, like we really didn't really know what was what was working. So yeah, bigger was better. Mm, the mantra stayed true. So nostalgia dad, what have you got for John? So you had mentioned I, I think this is maybe like kind of a good segue into the parts of Karazin that were accessible by, you know, nefarious means, I guess, uh during vanilla when uh we had those underwater crypt sections and the the hanging man and all of this stuff that eventually got scrapped and you kind of had to like glitch through to get into. And I remember back at the time, there was a lot of sort of um, like wives tales and 
like theories about stuff because nobody knew anything sure, and it was just sure. these room, creepy ass rooms with dead bodies and stuff yeah. um <laughs> and i know those didn't end up going anywhere but did those in some way influence what you later designed that we got to see as the final product in burning crusade no not really um that those areas i would compare that to what we're looking at with the alpha Karazhan. It's they were unfinished dungeons. There's a lot of just like they're not lush, you know, until you're going to really like first when you build something, you want to run through it and see is this big is, you know, how does this feel for size? Is this an instance? Is it a non instance dungeon? You know, is there a good gameplay? That's the first thing you don't do texturing. You don't do a lot of uh, you don't place props. You don't worry about lighting until you get the size knocked down. Because if you're changing the size, everything else changes too. So you have to redo everything anyway. So uh, yeah, all that stuff was we basically at the end of uh, WoW's development, Rob Pardo came in and said, hey, let's make this game for the casual players. Let's let people uh, level a lot faster than anybody ever imagined. And the repercussions of that, there are two major ones. One, it was very friendly to the casual players. Uh, they could, for, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say anything insulting, like, you know, the, the Care Bears, you know, they, they, they could actually reach 60, you know, they could, uh, it was it was a lot more pr- approachable it, game. It's all right, like John, I represent them, be as brutal as possible, the <laughs> filthy casuals. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what's a phrase that we would use that wouldn't be uh, <laughs> insulting to anyone. But uh, no, like for for the players who weren't super invested into an MMO, who had a life, who had you know a family and a job and other games that they wanted to play, that WoW wasn't their only game. We wanted to also get that audience because that's a much bigger audience than just the MMO audience. The MMO audience is still a niche audience. It's a it's a small audience when you look at the broader scope of all games so he had the foresight of just making it very approachable but the repercussion of that is that we had way too much content and so a lot of these unused assets were just uh they were either fallow like the swamp of sorrows or uh, you know uh i think it not not duskwood but uh uh there's a there's a marsh um Anyway, a lot of zones weren't used. A lot of areas weren't used. You just leveled past them. And it just, you know, they didn't get a lot of love. So, uh, yeah, and, and those those areas that you were talking about, they they got scrapped, too. Uh, the the, the uh, crypts around uh, Karazhan. But, no, they didn't inf- influence the Burning cru- Crusade, I don't think, at all. All right. Okay, Suna, do you have something for John on these um – early iterations of Karazhan. Whenever you guys were first messing around with Karazhan, you know, starting to work on it real hard, did you know that you were going to be switching the raid sizes down from like 20 and 40 down to like 10 and 25? Did it like, did it change how you built things or? No, no. Honestly, when we built uh, Karazhan, I think... Karazhan was going to always going to be a raid. We knew it wasn't going to be a 40 man raid, but we didn't know if it was going to be 20 people, 15 people, 25. Um, if it accommodated 40 again, when it was built, we were like, none of the level designers had seen, uh, raids. Um, I mean, I'd sat over the shoulder, Fuhrer, uh, Alex Alfrasabi, he would play. In the alpha, he would play the molten core with the fires of heaven, but that's about it. Uh, none of us had any idea of of how big the monsters were in raids. We didn't know how much space they would take, like a raid fight. We knew nothing, even. And I was the first level designer to actually, in fact, I think I might have, I might, I might even be the only level designer, even uh, up to the time when when I left the WoW team. Uh, who had even raided so it's mm. it's hard to get a good level designer but to find one who also enjoys raiding and uh playing through dungeons it's it's too much too much of a, a niche you know uh hobby it, to also you know play the game 
it's interesting to hear you say that, John, because the presumption has been from Haven's alpha uh, exploration video that just judging by the sheer scope and scale of it, that, you know, oh, this must have been a 40-man raid, you know, plans to be a 40-man raid. But to hear you say, like, when you're building them, you don't get told or anything or you don't know anything. You just get, no, to- you just get no, told, build a big area and whatever they do with it, they do with it. Is that pretty much it? Oh, yeah. And, the, and it's worse yet. We don't mm. like when they say big area, we don't know what they mean by <laughs> big area. Yeah. You know, like when, when I'm looking <laughs> through this, this would practice when I'm looking through this Karazhan, it's probably not even good for a five man dungeon. Like it's there's a lot of thin hallways. Hallways are terrible for combat. There's a lot of ramps. Ramps are terrible for combat. There's just so many areas where there's not the big hmm. fight that you even see in Skullamance. Like there's, I mean, it's it. Hmm. There, there's a lot of hallways and stuff like that. So, so it's no, yeah, big could have been just oh, it's a tall building, you know. Like when you don't know, when you don't understand gameplay big the word big doesn't mean anything you know unless you really explain it and it, unfortunately it was never explained so you don't remember Metzen or any of the guys geeking out around the office pre-launch going like oh karazan's gonna be this amazing raid it's gonna be awesome like we get 40 oh, people in there and it'll be great absolutely not let me tell you when someone's working on a dungeon it's usually the level designer and anybody who happens to walk into his office hmm. and uh like see what they're working on then if what they're working on is big and grandiose, then they'll go, ooh, ah, you know, and people mm. are, they're, they're, they're very prone to showing the people standing behind them, hey, you want to see what I'm working, you know, working on. Uh, but other than that, no, M- Matson could, he didn't even know, he had a concept of what Karazhan was in like 1996 or something, yeah. you, know, you know, or super early or crazy like so year after year after year goes by and we're waiting for the engine to catch up and for game design to catch up you stop getting geeked up you know and when his concept uh changed radically in 2000 and well that's when i I worked on it Hmm. no that was 2001 then maybe two years later jose worked on you know it Hmm. changed again you know if it's getting worked on again you know, he, he trusts the yeah. team. He doesn't actually have to mac- micromanage. Okay. Nobody knows what's going on. Well, it sounds like you've just pretty much, for the most part, answered a question from a listener, the meddling ba- meddling mage, who would have loved to have been on, on this chat, but given that he lives in Europe, <laughs> timing, timing was an issue. But he asked this. He said, the book The Last Guardian took place almost entirely inside of Karazhan and was published in 2002, the same time that WoW was being made. Did Chris Metzen give you, John, the same information on how to build the tower, and was it far more detailed than the instructions for the other dungeons, or was he given the task of re- or were you given the task of reading the book before creating the dungeon to make sure there was continuity or anything like that? But it sounds like not so. You know what? <laughs> I hate to say it. I did read the book. Um, and it was because me pestering Metzen for details. Like when you have to build like 40 rooms of something, you don't want to build something and for him to say, no, that, that wouldn't be there. Okay. So you really want to know what is the, what is the vibe of a place? And I usually pester him more than anybody else and, and getting as squeezing as many details as I can out of him. Like usually he'll just, he wants to paint in broad strokes and I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a little detail. So yes, he did actually give me that book and uh, it had a different cover. <laughs> I'm looking at the cover and it's not a, a recognizable cover, but yes, I did read The Last Guardian and um, uh, it didn't help. <laughs> it, okay. really, it, it was actually i mean other than that the library was a a big uh um what a big uh theme of the the castle it really didn't like mm-hmm. give me an idea of what mm-hmm. the castle was about other than a big spooky castle okay all right, guys, we'll think of your next questions and I'll, I'll lead you into that with one more of mine. And John, we'll sort of move past these early iterations and you've talked about design number one, you've talked about design number two, you've talked about the alpha plans. That's all great. Now we get to a 
stage where the game has launched. And people have noted that Karazhan was there. It just wasn't accessible. Now, some people say, well, you know, as, as they talk about this, tricks you can do to kind of explore a little bit. Um, did you know much at this stage after launch what the plans were for Karazhan or was it just left alone going, look, we didn't finish it in time. Let's just park it there. We'll come back to it in an expansion. Or was there ever a plan to do something with it in vanilla? Um, oh, yeah, there definitely was like maybe two years before we launched, we thought Karazhan would be part of the shipping game. But especially like when I mentioned they increased the leveling curve, that we wouldn't need Karazhan for anything at all. Then we decided to just, okay, let's just do the exterior. And that's what I worked on. That's the thing that I would, that's the last thing probably I worked on before uh, WoW shipped. Because you can't have a big hole. I mean, it was in Deadwind Pass, so we had to actually do the exterior. And having built the exterior, I had the interior all mapped out. That's been there and worked on that. But um, no, we, uh, it was just because of the leveling curve. So we knew we would push it off to later. And when, I mean, my gosh, it took Aaron, you know, uh, it took him a few months to, to, to build the, the rest of Karazhan. I think in March or something like that, um, he, I think that was the last dungeon he worked on. Uh, he, he moved to uh, another company. Um, but that, yeah, I think about March or May or something like that. So I have about five months he worked on it. And then it got scripted probably a year later when the, they knew what to do, how many quests were going into Karazhan, how many boss fights. That's when it was actually. So we're talking development terms, even in the final version, probably two to three years from beginning to end when it's actually scripted and itemized and spawned. So it's kind of really hard to expect any team to, to, to hold any, to any vision because the vision's going to change. You're going to learn so much in three years, especially after a game launches that, you know, you're going to want to change your plans. You're always going to change your plans. So. Yeah, we, we, we were all, that's why we were so loose with everything. It wasn't because we were kind of, you know, we didn't care or we didn't have any plans. It's just that we had plans, but we knew that the plans would change. Okay. All right, guys. Sorry, I lied. I've got one more, but guys, let's get into it in terms of the final iteration, the Burning Crusade version of Karazhan, the place that so many of us fell so in love with and obviously go through the design of it there. And everyone will we'll do like a bit of a dungeon crawl. So when I throw it to you guys after this question, let's try and start from, you know, maybe the stables and go walk our way through the dungeon and, and we'll keep going um, through all the different areas with John. But, and, and John, it's so funny because I should point out that in Twitch chat, uh, I've got, um, you know, people pointing out that, uh, you know, listener Vadudru, who's saying, Josh, please tell John that, you know, since he's heard it on the podcast, he's going to look at every ceiling in every dungeon from now on just for <laughs> you. <laughs> yes. But um, before we get inside, John, I actually want to talk about outside because another comment's come up in Twitch chat that I'm not going to lie. I, I mean, I appreciate why it happens, but it's still something that the inner geek in me goes like, huh, that's a little funny. When... Uh, Bor, sorry, let me say this right. Borjoisy hated says this. John Karazan seems bigger on the inside than it looks from the outside. Is it just odd magics at work? I guess. And and obviously, I understand that not everything needs to be in, you know to scale. And you go inside the instance portal, and you've got this absolutely massive instance and it's all great but this is one of the ones you know much like perhaps shadow fang keep where you can see the place in its entirety from the outside and you look at karazan you go oh, okay yeah great there's a tower and then you go inside and it does feel like there's you know obviously a lot more expanse to it but was there ever, ever any desire on your part to build it bigger externally to the player's view as they're you know rocking on up to it or is it just like look it's fine no, the interior and the exterior are always going to be at odds with one another, um, simply because uh, you you need to put a lot of gameplay into the interior, and you want to make the exterior epic. 
Now, the problem with a big object like Karazhan was that it's it's too big. It falls outside the clipping plane of a lot of low-end machines. So that's actually why we put the player approaching mid-level of the tower so that if you approached it and you were at the base of the tower, if you looked up, you wouldn't see the top of the tower. It would clip out. Your 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 uh, not uh video your video card would it would be a hard clipping um uh, of the geometry and you would see that clipping up against the sky. Um and that was a really ugly thing that we had to get around. So that's actually kind of why we scaled uh, the tower down. Plus, it's it's just unrealistic to make the uh, the exterior so big. Hmm. Now you can make it epic and tall and thin, but um, now I'm actually kind of proud that we did that uh, shadow fang. So uh, it was a lot of effort to. Uh, let's see, the player eventually gets to the very top of the tower. They can look out, I believe, um, and see down below. Now I don't know if their their cameras can actually look hmm. down but yeah i think you you do get to the top i think you can look outside that, yeah there's a there's a spot where you can run up the side and you go outside yeah. and then you can see and then you're also big old holes in the walls and stuff yeah and there was actually this one area where like it was a tall thin pencil basically that's what Carazon looks like and then you've got these giant rooms and those kind of like hung out over on one side but they disappeared when you're they didn't draw on if you're standing on the outside so it gets a little technical it's it's kind of hard to, to to even describe how the engine works but if you're in the instance dungeon um and you're looking at the dun the, the the side view of the dungeon it's not even remotely yeah there's no attempt it was a huge huge uh attempt to make the beginning and the end line up and as you're running up all the broken areas you can see the sky i i want to connect the player to the outside world i don't want them just to disappear in an instance so that i, I was really happy the way that worked but um no it's not uh Usually the only people who care that there's any uh, consistency and scale between the interior and the exterior, they're the, they're the guys who are building it. They're trying to make it mm. look re feel realistic. But the game design demands floor space. I mean, mm. you have to have floor space. So it's not even uh, – you don't even consider trying to make it uh, – if, 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 if it were all on a one-to-one -one basis, the entire tower – would just be one long set of stairs hmm. with very little gameplay. It would be very unfun. So it's not really even something we would consider or want to do. No, nor would I, I think nor would most of the player base expect it <laughs> of you. It's just one of those yeah. silly little things where the, like I said, the inner geek inside of me definitely goes like, uh, like architecturally speaking, I don't know if you could really fit all that in that space, John, but <laughs> I'm just sure. teasing, yeah. obviously. And we, it, it, and we did like play up like the, the library was supposed to be obviously bigger than the tower. We did actually want the library be to be, a 10 as far as epic uh, in magic. We wanted that to be very high fantasy where that's the TARDIS effect where you're in a room that's larger than the exterior of hmm. that room. Hmm. So we did want that. We, we purposely did that. We wanted that for the library, but hmm. for the rest of the, the dungeon, well, right. You know, <laughs> All right, let, let's tear through you guys again, starting with Norfair. What have you got for John as we start to take that first step into Karazhan? First off, the the music going in, I don't know if you had anything to do with that, but that harpsichord was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the music was, boy, again, that's like, it's kind of funny. In, in movie terms, we would say that's, they'd, they'd say that's done in post. Um, I had the, I wish that we want, I wanted a pipe organ to be playing throughout the dungeon and that to be the final boss room to have this giant pipe organ at the top of the, uh, the tower. But next, Metsa never, I never could sell him on that idea, but, uh, it did make it into the, 
Oh yeah, it did make it into the yeah the theater area. There was a big pipe organ organ there, but I wanted the pipe organ to just be running like you'd you'd be running through a hallway or the kitchen or the the the, the dining hall. I just wanted pipes going up from floor to ceiling and just have that as a kind of the 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 motif to carry hold all the rooms together thematically. Mm-hmm. But um, no one else liked that idea. So. <laughs> Okay, Nostalgia Dad, what have you got? Okay, so actually, I wanted to ask a question about, there's a section of Karazhan that doesn't really get used much. Now, there's the three optional bosses in the beginning that nobody ever touches, but there's a section above Autumn and the Huntsman called the Scullery, and it's like a, it's a big kitchen that then leads to the banquet hall. When you designed that, did you intend, were you picturing people beating the huntsman and then going through the scullery to get to Moreau's in the banquet hall? Or did you sort of expect people to backtrack and then go up the stairs to the grand ballroom and and kill Moreau's that way? Well, the, the, the thing about when you're doing a layout, you don't know even who the bosses were. Um, oh, that's right. We, right. you know, we don't know who the bosses were and we don't know like if one box or I'm sorry, one box, one boss is carrying a key that lets you into a gated area. So as far as like, like we talked about, um, Black Rock Depths, that was one where like all of these areas were, 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 were used at least by one, you know, at one point or another by these uh, exploring uh, all the quests kind of like pointed you to different areas. That's more of a, a thing where the quest designers see the design space that they have and they say, okay, how, I've, I, we only have like five or six or 10 quests, whatever it is. Well, how do we get through most of Karazhan? How do we give an incentive for people to explore all the areas of whatever the dungeon is? And it's kind of like, that's such a, well, first of all, Karazhan's so big, so big. So yeah, there's going to be fallow areas. That's for sure. So my, I had never seen the scullery until, uh, I was, gosh, my guild in Burning Crusade, I think we were like midway through Black Temple. We used to run, uh, like we used to hold like a, like pug events for Kara. And so we had done a Kara clear and I was like, oh, you know, I want to go explore these other rooms. And so I I just spent like an hour just like walking around. And I had never seen the scullery before. I didn't even know that was there until I'd been in there for like a year. So, and there's other parts of the instance that are like that too. But that one's like right in the beginning. And, and it's kind of a cool place. Yeah, I'm really, honestly, the, the, the ground floor is one of the things that I'm most proud of, especially the stables. I just how I love how that just holds together. Because when you're trying to do a tower and you're imagining the nobles and the royalty going in, you know, that you only have one entrance because there's only so much space at the bottom of the, you know, how do you get an entrance to actually thematically makes sense to both the stable boys and, you know, the people taking the carriage, the horses and stuff like that. And, you know, how do we deposit the the royalty? And so it actually makes sense at the beginning. And I kind of like that the, the stairs that go up to the, uh, the, the feasting halls area, uh, the, the servants quarters, all that was par- probably, I think that was our rubbled out area. That was going to, lead down that route was going to be go go down to where the flooded sections were so oh, yeah, that makes a lot of so sense cool. yes so that could have been like you know how like uh, upper and lower black rock spire is kind of like uh one dungeon kind of but it's the same instance that 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 was one way we could have done Karazhan, where just the flooded sections ju- would be one dungeon or or better example is just the uh the monastery same instance but just different wings of that instance now these wings were way bigger than the monastery but you know we didn't know that so we were just you know rocking and rolling with keeping a a, a theme consistent mm. okay sooner anything for john on these beginning uh areas of karazan yeah uh i remember listening to, I think it was this 
Skullamance or Skullamance or whatever, however the hell you pronounce that place, <laughs> uh, podcast the other day, and you were talking about how they took away a lot of the trash mobs that you thought should have been in there because it was like really empty. Right. Did you expect there to be that many trash mobs running around in Karazhan? Because it just seems like every five inches you're pulling another group of people. Uh, now here, here, here's, oh, boy, I don't know why. I can't remember why, but I've actually never done Skull uh, uh, Karazhan. I've never done Karazhan legitimately. Uh. I think uh, that's that's one. I can't remember why. Um, cause I was a crazy, uh, raider, uh, from Molten Core and I think I picked up, I did Black, yeah, I did Blackwing. I, I can't remember doing Karazhan legitimately. John, does so, that, does that eat away? Do you appear one of the dungeons that no. you designed that you never actually no, raided? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, it's, uh, you know, when you work on a file for so long, uh, you know, you get tired of looking at the textures, like, you know, and there's no, you don't associate this, this area as a place for fun. You know, it, it, it's, you're annoyed that I actually rather play on someone else's dungeons because you see the flaws and then one of the imperfections. We had a, we had a, a, a programmer leave uh, the WoW team for a while and he played WoW and he worked for another company, but it just bugged him that there were so many bugs in the code that like he just at home wrote a whole bunch of bug fixes <laughs> while he's, you know, this is his off time. Okay. This is, you know, when he's not working on weekends uh, and they came back to Blizzard and said, yeah, I really want to come back to Blizzard because I've got a lot of fixes for your code, you know, on some of the things. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'd rather play somebody else's stuff because I know what my dungeons look like, you know, mm -hmm. um, I plus there's always the chance of you being you know, like say if I had a really cool area, you know, and it's not used. Um usually I don't think we have mm. that problem. Um, oh well there but, you go. Uh, so you didn't you haven't felt the uh the experience of going from trash to trash through Karazan before? No, no, I actually did so lucky. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you know, that may have been just one of the things that we despawned. I can't remember. Mm. I, I remember if you read the let's see. Yeah, it was the Skullamance. I wrote an article, uh, Skullamance uh, Bones to Pick. Mm -hmm. If you go to my webpage, when it's ready dot com, on the under the interviews and articles sections, there's uh, four articles that I wrote that aren't in the WoW diary. And I'll give you, first of all, a taste of my writing skills and, you know, the type of voice that I have and the type of material that I cover. That's kind of, I was, I was giving you a little bit of taste of, you know, what was in the book. And in one of those articles was uh, Skullmance and how we despawned everything after actually really forcing everybody to look at the spawning uh, methodologies for uh, uh, our, our shipping game. So, yeah, and I don't know if we – that was actually before Karazhan was uh, spawned. So, oh, gosh. Yeah, I, I'm surprised that it was overspawned. To be honest, now that now that I I don't think it was overspawned. It well, se sure it I seemed it was pretty pretty right actually. I don't remember hearing as much complaints about it as I seem to hear. As I say, you know, I haven't run it, but you do get the complaints about Scholomance being quite populated. I think that John, I think yeah. you mentioned, but um, John, you mentioned something that I'd love to touch on. Just when you started talking about the stables, and when you start to talk about the actual functionality of this place and you say as you say the, the the nobles the aristocracy going in and out you know they've they've got a place where they obviously you know park their horses and whatnot and again the meddling mage wanted to ask you this one had he have been here i'll ask in his stead john how did you go about you know and i love the stables but how did you go about making the tower make functional sense such as you know kitchens stables ballrooms without sacrificing the flow of the dungeon and you've talked about this a bit in the past in in brd you said you right. wanted it to feel lived in it's not just a space to go in and kill monsters right. you want to make Sensible. people feel yeah so so how did you do that without sacrificing that flow well, uh, part of the uh, one of the considerations for 
level design is immersion, the level of immersion. And you can make it more immersive if you make it look functional, if you make it look believable. And I'd done multiple term papers uh, in school on castles. I, Whenever I go to a new city, I look at tours through the mansions and the big houses. And I, I, I really do, under, I, I love understanding how what's the function of this building how does it work you know where where are the big groupings of rooms and so i have a you know i i like that type of stuff and of course i love applying that what i've learned to a an area so the good question with that is is actually if you make a believable area the flow of the dungeon comes afterwards. It comes from the quest designers and the game designers when they look at the assets that they're walking through. Now, this is, again, Vanilla WoW uh, methodology that changed, uh, I think, in Burning Crusade. Uh, but uh, when it's coming from the level designers, they're looking at it with fresh eyes and going, oh, that's what, oh, that makes sense. Okay, you know, from from that layout, then they go, okay, let's make the flow this way. Okay. And that's where, that's where it's decided. Uh, so I don't even know what the flow is going to be decided two years from what, what, when, when I'm building something. So yeah, it's not even, <laughs> it's not even a consideration really. I mean, you do have some general idea that, okay, you know, you want some area to be, uh, uh, have some relation to another, you know, I kind of like doing that, but, uh, uh, yeah, like the specifics of like the layout, hmm. it could have been, been 10 bosses in Karazhan, you know, if it were a five man dungeon, if, if it turned out that people liked going to a dungeon over and over and over before it's finally cleared, uh, yeah, you could easily say 10, 20 bosses in all these little side rooms. If it were, you know, different wings of a dungeon, hmm. you know, Okay. Well, guys, I'm going to ask one more and then please piggyback off of any answers that John gives here and we'll go through another round of your questions after this one. But John, there's a lot of specific areas to get through in Karazhan and we'll start going through them now. Now, I appreciate that previously on the show you've said... Hey everyone, remember that was just part one of that chat, so if you're wanting to hear even more about the making of Karazan, then please do tune in next week as we'll go through that place area by area with John then. But for now, let's get to the next call. Alright, it's time for another countdown to Classic Call. And we have two phenomenal guests on the line for this one. Another big trip down memory lane and talking about some pretty big events in the history of Vanilla World of Warcraft. Now, a lot of you will remember that relatively recently on the show, I spoke with 1927, who was a member of Death and Taxes. And many of you know, Death and Taxes was, you know, one of the absolute elite guilds, number one, number two. However you want to deem it, they are upper echelon in terms of skill, in terms of vanilla World of Warcraft. Now, 1927 did a phenomenal job, and a lot of you really, really enjoyed his spots on the show, and you've written to me and told me, get 19 back, and I hope to get 19 back one day soon for sure. But 19 obviously could only speak about a relatively short window of time with Death and Taxes as he talked about how he jumped in around uh, AQ and then left. Um we're lucky enough now to be joined by the main tank for Death and Taxes, who was there for a much larger period of time than 1927 was, who'll be able to fill in a lot of the gaps that we weren't able to hear from 19, obviously just by virtue of him not being there. So I want to say a really big countdown to Classic Welcome to Exodex. How are you, Maze? I'm good. I'm good. How about yourself? Very well, very well. I'm so glad that you were up for this chat and that 1927 obviously kindly got in touch with you and put you onto the podcast and you put your hand up for this one. And joining you on this call is another very exciting guest because when we talk about death and taxes, it's almost impossible to have that conversation without also invoking the name of another guild, and that is Nihilum. And I've been chasing down a member of Nihilum for so long now, and I'm so happy that we finally got one on the show. And I want to say a big welcome to Dreddy. How are you? 
Thank you. I'm uh, quite good, a bit tired, but all good. Yeah, I do appreciate it. I know I think it's very late at night where you are, and a lot of these European callers lately have been doing the hard yards for Countdown to Classics, staying up till midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., just to be on the show, and I can't thank you enough for doing that. But we'll try to get you out of here relatively soon, uh, and, and so you're not up all night. But this is going to be a fun chat, guys, that I'm really looking forward to, to go back and forth from the different perspectives of what you guys were seeing while these World First races were going on, and also talking about just generally hardcore rating in vanilla and sort of what it took to be the best of the best. Now, Exodex, I'll start with you. If you could just give people, uh, sorry, give people a little bit of an explanation as to your background with the game, when you started with Death and Taxes, how you got involved with Death and Taxes, and what your role was, obviously, again with them. All right, so I started playing during the alpha um, back in, you know, Vanilla WoW. Um, started playing on Shattered Hands. I was playing with a guild called Skyfang, and then uh, we started raiding Molten Core with Drama because we didn't have enough people to field the 40 people. So it was like a dual, you know, dual guild raid, dual guild raid with uh, Drama and Skyfang. Um, eventually, we parted ways, and I was with Skyfang. I left Skyfang, made my own guild Indomitable. Um, and then shortly after that, while we were progressing in Blackwing Lair, um, Death and Taxes approached me, you know, and they were like, hey, you know, our main tank is, you know, getting busy with real life, you know, we need a main tank. Would you be interested? So, and then, uh, this was around the time period, right. When drama got world first, uh, Nefarian. And then, uh, I said, sure, you know, I ended up leaving my guild, you know, and I joined death and taxes. Um, so I started main tanking from there on out, you know, all through black and layer and up until we got us first Illidan. Very good. And obviously we'll go step by step through some of the trials and tribulations of the guild along the way. But um, now what I'll do is, Dreddy, I'll get you to give us a bit of an introduction into your side of the story. And how did you join uh, Nihilum? When did you do- join Nihilum? And when did you leave? I basically joined uh, Nihilum at the beginning of the race in the Naxxramas. And I started playing the game. In I, I think it was after the release of Blackwing Lair. Uh, I was quite young, so I had school and such, but I started to slowly play, and then I joined the Helium right after, uh, between AQ40 and uh, Naxxramas release, so I joined during the race for Nax, and they were looking for people, and it was before CrossFram came and such, so it was a bit easier to enter those big guilds and prove yourself. It wasn't as much competition. Okay, and just uh, so we're sort of all very clear as to who was playing what. Uh, Dreddy, you were playing an Undead Warlock, did you say? Is that right? Yes, that's that's correct. I was playing an Undead Warlock um, throughout the entire Naxxramas. And that character's name was Dreddy, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And Exodex, you also had a character actually named Exodex. And what... Uh, yeah, it was a human warrior. Very good, very good. Okay. Now, guys... What what I want to know is, Exodex, I'll start with you, is if we just talk about um, perhaps from AQ onwards. Well, let's focus on that KT kill. Now, from your perspective, do you remember just very briefly being frustrated out of your mind with what you guys were trying to do and the bug that popped up with KT? Yeah, I mean, uh, we killed, so we killed Forestman and then we killed Saffron and then we got to kill Thuzad. We would have killed him, and then when he was switching from the first phase to the next phase of the fight, he despawned. And uh, GMs happened to be watching on us. They saw what happened, so they were actually communicating with us, so they respawned him. And the same thing happened. When we pushed him over to the next phase, he despawned. And then they kept respawning him, and the same thing kept happening. So they tried to fix, you know, impl- uh, apply a hotfix, and it just didn't work. So they had to actually, you know, come up with a new patch and stuff like that, which, again, you know, the European servers got it first the following day, I believe it was, or something like that. And they came up first, which is why we didn't get World First Kelpuzad at that point, which was a little disheartening, but it is what it is. Now, Dreddy, you were obviously there on the other side, and that's a story that we've heard on the podcast before about this you know, issue that happened with Kel'Thuzad. Do you remember from the Nihilum angle what was going on around that race against death and taxes for Kel'Thuzad? Uh, yeah, it was a bit intense, i give you that, but... We had a few situations. Uh, we never, I, I don't recall we having those kind of problems with the boss despawning at that phase change, but I do remember that we had 
two one percent wipes on the boss and then the boss just didn't respawn and we had to wait for soft reset and uh, all all of those things that's what i briefly remember like that and when the soft reset kicked in we went fully uh with every buff you could get in the game more or less now you you said it was a bit intense and I'd love to know, obviously, all of you European players over there at Nylum, what was the chatter like within the guild? Was it obvious, like, we have to beat death and taxes? Was there a lot of talk about it, or were you just focused on doing the best that you could do and not worried about what is ever, whatever was happening externally? Well, from my what I did was mostly I was focusing on myself and just playing. I think a lot of people did it. We didn't really see the race that we know that it was a race, but we were just focusing mostly on ourselves. But the uh, the guild was a bit divided between people who you communicated to and uh, whatnot. We usually stick to our own nations, basically. So it was a bit split in that regard. But it was some some, some internal talk. But mostly it was just focusing on ourselves. And if we get the for world first, we get the world first, basically. How did it feel, Dreddy, when you got that world first on KT? I can still hear the screams. <laughs> and, um, I mean, obviously you guys did it with um, a, a figure that is very well known within, you know, the classic circles and the vanilla circles or whatnot, a name that's still invoked now. You had the guild leader, Kunian, and um, was Kunian particularly vocal about pushing, obviously pushing for that world first, and how do you remember him celebrating, if at all, after it all happened? Well, he he wasn't vocal, he was mostly typing, because we were like, we were split in it, ventrilos and such, we knew it's like everyone was in their own channels, so we didn't really communicate that way, but he was a really quick typer, and it was a lot of caps lock afterwards, I can tell you that, when we killed the boss. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Exodex, I'll turn back to you. And, and just while we sort of finish up on this whole KT thing, obviously you guys um, had your issues with KT. We've heard a little bit from, from 1927 just about the facts of what happened. But from you, what was the feeling like within the guilds when this thing happened with Nylum swooping in when you guys were bugged out? I mean... People were disappointed because we felt like it was our first world first and we were robbed because of a bug, basically. The other thing, you know, we actually had someone that played with Nihilum in our guild, this guy named Awake or whatever, which at the time I don't think we knew that he was had close ties to Nihilum and he had been with us from the moment we started progress. He eventually quit um, at some point during Nax progress because uh, he couldn't handle the, envir- the raid environment that we had. Um, and he went back to play with Nihilum full, full time. So, um, you know, there was a lot of theories as to whether or not he was feeding them information, you know, with our progress and stuff like that. But that's something, you know, that a lot of people don't, don't know about. Okay. Well, I mean, a lot of years have passed since then. We can all sort of look back, whether it be tongue in cheek or have a bit of a laugh about it. Dreddy, do you know anything about that? Is there anything you can divulge or you you know you, this is the first you're hearing of it? Um. Uh... No, I don't. I think if something was talking about that, it was more in private with Kungen and the other officers. So I really don't have any idea what they were actually talking about. Fair enough. If he gave something away or not, I have no clue. Okay. Exodex, I'll turn back to you and just ask with what happened with KT, was there a little bit of a resolve in the guild from this point on to, you know, just try all again, try it all again in Burning Crusade or? What were you guys thinking when that next expansion hit? What were your goals? Uh, Initially, everyone was excited for the expansion up until they announced that 40-man raids would be cut down to 25-man raids. And that's pretty much, that was like the beginning of the end of the guild. Um, A lot of people, a lot of our, you know, main raiders ended up quitting, you know, either prior or or early on in the Burning Crusade, simply because, you know, it, it wasn't the same. You know, you're, you're cutting the raid practically in half at that point. So what actually happened? I mean, as the main tank, you obviously were maybe involved in some pretty key decisions being made. Were hearts broken? Were, um, you know, a lot of uh, fights going on? Or was everyone diplomatic about it? What do you remember of that transition? Well, I mean, the raid environment in DNT was like, it was just like a dysfunctional family. Like, you had that thick skin. Um, you know, it was... It was just a madhouse. I mean, there was a lot going on. 
a lot of different personalities clashing and stuff like that. And then, like, you know, when they announced the fact that there wouldn't be 40 man rating, a lot of people were like, you know, upset about it. And, you know, there was a lot of heated debate as to who would be a part of the main raid and stuff like that. And it was just a complete crap, you know, shit show, basically. Do you remember those first few raids in Burning Crusade doing the 25 man thing? How did you feel about the change in, you know, the meta or, you know, how you approach with so fewer people around? Uh, we had to basically rebuild because we, we struggled to even field or field a solid 25. So we had a lot of new faces, a lot of new members that weren't a part of the original Max. You know, uh, it was it was definitely some uh, tough. Mm. What what was it like for you wearing? You know, whether it, you could call it the pressure or whatnot of being the main tank for one of the top two guilds in the world when that expansion came out. Uh, I mean, it was thinking back to it. I mean, I was a young kid, so like I was probably around. I don't know, 17 at the time or something like that. Uh, it, it, it was, you know, an immense amount of pressure, uh, you know, but the main thing was always trying to, you know, stay positive and, you know, reinforce the fact that, you know, even though we had a lot of new faces, um, you know, it was still possible to, you know, compete at the you know top level. Okay. Dreddy, moving into the Burning Crusade, you've obviously scored this KT World First. Do you remember what the sort of company line for Nihilum going forward was? Was Kunian saying, right, let's get heaps more of those. This is the way it's going to be. We're, we're going to up our game. Or, or what, what was the uh, intent or the way in which you guys approached Burning Crusade? Uh, well, we were quite fellow ourselves. We really wanted to get new world first, more world first. So our first goal was level to 70 as quickly as possible. You have less than a week. and we were going to raid the same week the game was uh, released or the expansion was released. So it was uh, really like no sleep farm all the way. Do you have any memories of that race for Illidan? Uh, no, I had already actually left uh, for real life when uh, that race actually began. Got it. So I wasn't for Illidan. No worries, no worries. That's fine. Exodex, do you have memories, obviously, of that race for Illidan? Uh, for Illidan, um, at that point, we kind of knew we weren't going to compete for World First. I mean, we tried, but you know, by the time the servers came up for the U.S. side, they already had World, like they were already reading. You know, they were deep into the raid; they had gotten to World First and things. So it was, a, you know, completely different situation at that point. Um, and then we kind of settled for going for U.S. Hmm. Going through all of that. Uh, expansion, if I just talk about the Burning Crusade as a whole, Exodex, is there a point that you can highlight that was particularly challenging for Death and Taxes, even as good as you were? Did you find any boss or anything in particular like, oh, fuck, this is a bit, you know, tough? Because it's obviously some of those Burning Crusade encounters people point back to. You know, I remember all the posts going up about Lady Vash and, and obviously... Um, uh, Kael'thas and whatnot as being, you know, a little bit of a stress test for some people. Do you have any memories of that? Um, like Lady Vosh was a little tricky, but once we got it down, it wasn't, you know, it was a lot of trial and error, or as we would call it, dick and door progress. Um, you know, it wasn't, I don't think there was any encounter that was like, oh, wow, like, you know, like the original Nax. Nax was like really, you know, probably the hardest uh, raid that we did. If now that I think back, all right, well, I mean, I'll pick up on that one. If you're sort of looking back and still highlighting Nax as obviously the, the pinnacle of difficulty for you guys, talk us about, you know, some of the problems you might have had progressing through Nax. Was there any particular speed bump that caused a bit of friction prior to KT? Uh, four horsemen would probably be the most notable encounter. Um, you know, that, that seemed to be, that was like probably the encounter that killed a lot of guild. Uh and, you know, made people think twice about continuing to play the game, you know, in terms of rating. Mm. Uh, that was uh, <laughs> that, that was probably the, uh, I, I'd say, the hardest thing. And you guys still got the world first on that one, right? Yeah, we did. It's, it's I in- mean, Saffron and Kalthuzad afterward were like a total joke, to be honest with you. Mm. It's interesting to hear, obviously, because I get a kick out of it. We talk about, you know, some of the best guilds in the world, and some people maybe just presume that, 
oh, you know, they just face roll everything. They don't sweat. Or, but it's good to hear that, no, like even the best sort of scratch their head sometimes and go, what the fuck is going on here? Dreddy. I mean, we had a lot of dumb wipes, man. Like, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, it's all right. We, we wiped on Thaddeus, you know, jumping, like the jump over the uh, platform on Thaddeus. Like that was, we, we wiped up to that because people would miss it. Oh, that's so good to hear that even death and tax, taxes like, members I, were missing I cause out. wipes because I miss a jump. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Dreddy, do you remember anything with Nylum going through Nax in terms of um, funny little speed bumps that you hit or even members of, you know, such an elite guild, you know, mucking up and getting things wrong at, at certain points? Yeah, well, it was mostly the same fight. I mean, for Horsemen was the hardest fight in there in my opinion as well and it required a lot of coordination between every 40 player there so it was quite annoying and people kept dying to these uh, black puddles that spawned and some people couldn't see them and then people started to use that as an excuse every time they died to it because they didn't want to admit they actually died to mechanics so it was quite nasty on that fight Mm. And um, same with Thaddeus, the jump is always a classic. But the most problem we had with Thaddeus was uh, server lag. It was insanely laggy on that. It started to go in frames and all such things. We got stuck there for a bit because of all the server lag. Exodex, you just mentioned off call and I felt the need to start up the call again. You just said off the cuff, it's funny that Dreddy mentioned lower there because you remember five manning it. And we both said, what? And you'll have to go into that a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, we had a lot of smart people in our guild, and, you know, they had spreadsheets, they would run numbers all day, theory craft, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we all did it, you know, and uh, basically, you know, we had this guy in our guild that had, like, millions and millions of guild because he basically ran the auction house, and uh, his name was Cheesy Craft, and, uh, you know, a couple of people were like, you know, I, I think the number, if the numbers are, if my math is right, this guy named Lux, who was a rogue, ironically, and then this other guy named Anujit, who was a priest, they both agreed. They're like, yeah, we're running our numbers, and we think we can actually five-man this boss as long as there's no enrage timer. So, you know, people bet you know bet money with uh, this guy named Cheesycraft as to whether or not we could five-man the boss, and it was a bet. It was a joke, so we actually tried it. So it was me, three priests, and a warlock. And uh, so everyone died, and we started the encounter. Um, and it was just, we five-manned it. It was like, I, I think the fight lasted almost like 30 minutes or something like that. And, you know, he had no enrage timer. So we had, you know, with the with the three warlock or with the three shadow priests and the one warlock, they were able to heal me and keep me up. And we five-manned the 40-man boss. And then Blizzard, once they found out about this, they ended up adding an enrage timer to the boss because of us. That's insanity. That's fantastic to hear. Obviously, you guys must have been pretty excited to have done that. Were there a few cheers when it went yeah, down? Yeah, it was funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was hilarious. Uh, it, it was good times. <laughs> very good, very good. Guys, now that we've covered sort of a bit of the history, and thank you so much for sort of just telling us what it was like going through that back in the day with either of those guilds, I've got a few questions for you that the listeners would kill me if I didn't ask because a lot of people are really interested what – you know, you guys as old school, hardcore raiders would think about the way in which things are done these days. Now, I should set this up with just sort of asking, do you guys still play the game? Do you play on private servers? Do you play retail? Are you going to be playing classic or whatnot? Exodex, I'll just start with you. Um, I haven't played the game. So I quit after we got US for Sullivan. I, you know, I sold my account. You know, I don't care if People want to judge me about it, but whatever. Um, I know a lot of my old guild members weren't happy about that. Um, and then I came back for a little bit during Wrath of Lich King. Probably I played the game probably for like a couple weeks, and then I quit again, and I haven't played it since. Um, I do intend on play, playing Classic. Um, I'm not sure yet if I plan on playing Horde or Alliance. I haven't decided that yet. So have you paid much attention to the game at all over the last few years? I'll look into the game here and there, but I don't really keep up with it. I just know that now, like, you know, world firsts are done, you know, during the beta or during the uh, testing realm. Hmm. And Dreddy, I'll ask you, have you been playing private servers? Have you um, been playing retail? What's your sort of, how would you define your current knowledge of, of vanilla World of Warcraft or World of Warcraft in general? Uh, I have played a little bit on private servers, but not so. I have 
play the every expansion so far though since vanilla so i've been caught up quite a lot okay all right no worries well now that we know that exit x i'll turn back to you and just sort of get both of your feelings on this one but we'll start with you um listener okazy asks can you guys um give your thoughts on world buffs basically and how they relate to progression attempts and exodex you already mentioned something about um I, I think it was you you know getting all the world world buffs that you could back in the day and, and going through the content um so i just ask firstly was that sort of a, a prerequisite or something that happened with every death and taxes run like you tear through and get all the world buffs and also what do you think about the application of world buffs to come in classic? And is it something that you foresee many guilds will sort of obviously try and do? Are you okay with it? Are you not okay with it? What do you? How do you feel about them in general? I think it was essential. Like we would try min max. Like we would go to Dire Mall, get the Dire Mall buffs when Dire Mall was around. Um, you know, we'd make sure we had flasks, uh, stone skin potions you name it, like even regular pots, because um, in an emergency situation that could keep you alive as a tank. Um, you know, we had, you know, DPS buffs, you name it. Like we, especially for like, you know, during progress, you know, we would, we would go back, get the world buffs, zone in and do our thing. Um, I mean, do I, am I against it? No, I mean, it's part of the game. You're taking advantage of every mechanic available to you. Do you feel like it made you too powerful at all and you should try and do the content without them in the sort of you know get take all the hits that blizzard can throw at you in a way i don't think it made made us too like powerful or anything i just it allowed us to have more wiggle room to make an error you know because we're you were humans like you know it's funny you you mentioned earlier i think that like you guys talked about how i guess people had this have this perception of like us being gods here i guess right in terms of like how we play the game but you know, we, we made our dumb mistakes. You know, we wiped, you know, stupidly and stuff like that. Dreddy, I'll turn to you and ask you for your viewpoint on world buffs and um, also your your memories of what Nihilum's policy was with them and how you think, you, what your attitude is towards them in Classic. I mean, the world buffs gave you quite more stats, especially if you went for all of them. And it was quite essential, as in my opinion, as well, because... All, all this percentage increase, it, it, it added up quite a lot for each encounter. Uh, I don't remember us using it for every encounter in the Nux, but mostly for the last kills and uh, bosses we really haven't killed yet. For first kills, we went for the buffs as much as possible. Even just farming, you know, tubers and such in uh, Felwood that didn't go on certain uh, cooldowns like other pots and such. You know, every buff you could get or uh, help on the side. Hmm. And since certain mechanics, especially for like uh, Loa Theb, where that was quite a nasty fight because of healers you're only being able to throw a heal every minute, and you needed, you wanted as much health and such as possible, and everything that couldn't self heal or heal you up in any way. So the buffs, in my opinion, was very important. Even just the buffs for. Uh, uh, Eastern Plague Land Tower buffs that gave you... It, it was just 5% health increase, I think, or something, but 5% could be the difference between life or death. Now, Dreddy, you mentioned that you've played every expansion of WoW. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Have you been raiding as well, even up to this day? Yes. Okay. Well, you're the perfect person for this question because um, listener uh, Arg, argsint123 asks... Can you compare what raiding was like back in the day with Nihilum versus what it's become now? <laughs> That's a quite complicated question, but I would say that raiding now mechanic-wise is more difficult than it was in vanilla, but classes have a way to counter every mechanic in a completely different way now than it could before. So you needed all these extra buffs, these health pots, these potions, all this farm to be able to survive mechanics in vanilla. And one misstep and you're dead, but you can actually afford mistakes now in an, in another perspective in nowadays. But it, it's it's quite hard to actually, I don't know how to say it, but... It, hard to put hard your to finger compare. on? Yeah, it's hard to really compare because it, it's... It, Technically, it's completely different games. In my Absolutely. Opinion. I agree. I agree. Exodex, I'll turn back to you as we sort of 
get on the home stretch for this call and just sort of say, um, you know, with your plans to come back to classic, would you ever consider sort of doing it the way in which you did it before? Or are you going to be, you know, obviously a little bit older um, priorities maybe have changed. I'm not sure. Or um, do you want to be a bit more casual or is it like, no man, if I'm playing classic, I'm, I'm all in. How do you approach this re-release if you will of vanilla? (laughs) I don't think I'm going to play hardcore like I did back, you know, in the early was it 2005 or whatever, 2006. Uh, it's going to be a healthy balance. Um, and I think it'll depend on who I play with. Uh, I don't think I'll be going for world first. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the same, to be honest with you. What are you rolling? I'll probably play warrior again, just because, uh, you know, tanking. It's just, I, I mean, I, I don't think I'll want, I'd want to play anything. Fair enough. And Dreddy, I'll turn to you for the, the last couple of points. And um, uh, first of all, I just asked Dreddy, what are you planning on rolling for Classic? I'm not sure yet, but Warlock is going to be my safety line if I can't design something else. Okay, fair so enough. So it's, it's, it's up to grabs at this point. I haven't really decided. All right, fair enough. And, and Dreddy, I just want to end on this. I asked you earlier about um, Kunian, and if I can get you to stretch back in the memory banks as far as we can and, and sort of any kind of interactions that you had with him and um, thinking of him in general as a person. Back then, Kunian was somewhat of a larger-than-life figure in the World of Warcraft community, not in terms of sort of being you know, completely out there as a personality, but just in terms of the knowledge that he had of the game, his input on, um, you know, I think, forums and whatnot, and just being, just being a known name. Um, what was it like playing with him what memories do you have of him as a player and a person and you know any light that you can shed on this sort of a a guy that's become a little bit of a um you know uh he's sort of stepped away from the scene but you know is slightly keeping tabs on it now and a few people are wondering you know whether he's coming back for classic i think he might be but tell us a bit more about what you uh experiences that you had playing with him i mean he he really showed insane amount of dedication to, to to push the guild forward he, he was never like a harsh person but he had some ground rules you know and you need to be attending the raids you need to be active even if you're not in the raid you need to be prepared to just jump in on a second's notice as a stand-in and such and he even uh, went into certain fights just to double check every single mechanic on his own, see how much damage he took and how to counter each mechanic. He showed extreme dedication just to, to get every part of information we could just to you know kill the boss as easily as possible. So he showed extreme dedication. He was really good raid leader, a really good leader overall. Do you remember if he was like, you know, was he funny or chatty in guild chat when you guys were outside of raids or anything? Or was it kind of all business all the time or somewhere halfway in between? You let me know. For me, mostly he was all business more or less. But I didn't really play with him on the side when he was playing like Dota 1 and such. He had his officers. He played a lot of things on the side. So he might have shown another personality on the side. But for me, it was just work work more or less okay fair enough now guys i I, thank you so much for coming on the show i guess one last question i'd I'd sort of have um just to see if you guys have actually seen it at all have either of you guys kept tabs on the kind of things that hardcore guilds in private servers are doing these days the last time i looked into it i I guess speed running was a thing i mean i you know that's about it that's all i remember when i looked into it I guess what I'm getting at is, have you guys seen anything that has surprised you with how far the development of the meta of vanilla World of Warcraft has come? You know, albeit on private servers where the data might be a little bit different. But, you know, do, do you ever see a video or hear of a conversation where you're like, wait, what? They took down Molten Core in how long? Or what? They they went through Nax and sort of with that makeup? And, you know, do you hear anything that makes you think, God, it's come a long way? No, I mean, it'll be interesting to see uh, how these players that put so much time into private servers uh, transition into, you know, retail. Definitely. And uh, all right, guys, well, look, on that note, I I just want to thank you so much for for taking the time out for Countdown to Classic today. It's been a really great, um, 
you know, thing that I've wanted to do for a while is, is get sort of two people like you side by side, Death and Taxes and Nihilem, and sort of have that contrast there and talk to people who were such, you know, skillful players and, and considerable, you know, figures um, back in the day. So Exodex, thank you so much for coming on the show, mate. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. And Dreddy, thanks so much to you, man. You can, uh, I can finally let you get some sleep. <laughs> thanks for letting me be here as well. My pleasure. Really My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Hi, everyone. Josh here. I just want to take a quick moment to remind you that while Countdown to Classic will always be a podcast you can get for free, if you do happen to really enjoy the show and find yourself always coming back for more, then please do check out the show's Patreon page to see how you can help keep the lights on at Countdown to Classic and even vote on show content as the show continues to bring you more and more classic wow goodness. Alternatively, if monthly subscriptions aren't your thing, you can always visit the show's tip jar over at Ko-Fi with that link being in the show notes and on the website too. Now, let's get back to the show. All right, it's time for another countdown to Classic Call, and we have a listener on the line. Sarah, how are you? So good to talk to you. I'm doing fine, Josh. Thanks for having me. My absolute pleasure. Now, just for the listener's benefit, I'll just let you know that Sarah got in touch with me recently and um, basically sent me one of the more in-depth emails that I've ever received for the show, and I was really blown away by the sort of depth that he went to in explaining to me a number of things that he felt hadn't been explained on the show. And I said, well, you know, realistically, there's there's no time like the present. Would you like to come on the show and actually explain some of these things yourself? And luckily, he was keen enough to come on and do that. So I'm ho- so happy to have you here, Sarah. But also, we actually started talking when you let me know that you won a uh, a bet recently off of information that you heard off of the show, which I got a really big kick out of. And um, I'll let you tell a little bit of the story quickly for the listeners. How is it that um, you basically came to use Countdown to Classic to your advantage recently? Imagine you get an email from uh, your old raid leader from a decade ago who you haven't been in contact with for more than 10 years. and He's very persistent, telling you, hey, we've had a bet once. You won. There's this Australian guy. He's running a show. He's interviewing old game designers and game developers, and apparently that stuff that was so unnatural that he's been doing all the time was not that unnatural at all. It was actually intended gameplay. And that thing was, um, I believe, was Hunter Malay weaving that you heard about in the Kevin Jordan segment about Hunters. Is that right? It, we didn't call it like that back in the days, but yes, it was basically that in essence. Yeah, so for those of you who don't remember, during Kevin's interview, he actually stated that the original intention when Hunters were designed was not to be doing nothing necessarily during, uh, so in between auto shots. There was somewhat of a desire from the developers back in the day to have the Hunter getting involved with Malay hits at times. So obviously that is something, a bit of sort of enlightening information <laughs> that got Sarah, um, the benefit, the benefactor, I should say, of a, a winning bet. So that was so great to hear. And we obviously kicked off a conversation from there. And, um, you brought up a few more points that you said that now you've been introduced to the show. You, you've heard a little bit of the show and there's some few extra points that you'd love to, to hear, uh, being raised. And I thought, well, as I said, there's no person like you to raise it. So I'll go through a few of these points one by one with you. And, and as I said, your email was absolutely incredible. It blew me away with the way in which you explain these things and your level of knowledge of vanilla. So I'll start you with your first point that you raised to me, which is, do you want to explain to people what uh, you know of Warriors' defensive stances and the threat generation that they gained from that and what the community might not completely understand by virtue of what they got with private servers. This is primarily about the topic of uh, battle shell tanking. That's something that people have heard about, people know about, because Blizzard deliberately called it out in patch notes that it's basically learn to play it properly. This isn't going to work anymore. But this is bound to how the threat modifiers work in the original game concept. 
every ability that you do is either going to deal a certain amount of damage or healing or recover mana, and this is producing threat, either by that value, reduced or increased by certain factors. And there are abilities that have no direct influence, like buffs, like debuffs, and those abilities have a certain threat value tucked onto them. It's a separate variable that sits in the game files. Battleshout has this. It's a surprisingly low number. It's just 50 or 55 threats, depending on which rank you're using. And just with that alone, usually people would think, well, 50 threat is nothing, a level 30 character is dealing more damage on this. How could people tank with this? Why was this even a thing? Well, it turns out that using Battleshot was producing 50 threats, divided evenly among all targets. But the buff application of Battleshot was missing the string. So we had an ability that was not dealing damage, that had an empty data string on how much threat it was supposed, supposed to produce. And this pretty much broke the formula when used in defensive stance, which has a multiplier for that value. If there's nothing to multiply, this was creating a little problem. And you can see this in old raid movies of renowned guilds like Curse, like Nihilum, doing twin emperors in AQ40. One twin is immune to physical abilities. You cannot tank the twin with a warrior or a druid for it what it's worth. It's, in theory, impossible. And yet there, heading over to YouTube, Curse versus Twin Emperors, you see, well, they're tanking it with two warriors, and the warrior's just standing there, spamming battle shout. That's a problem that's hopefully not going to return with Classic, even though it would be uh, true to the original product recreation. But it if that were to return, it would create a lot of problems with threat-based encounters. Okay, and so your your point was that effectively, um, you know, were that the case? And and I, I've heard some people say that you know, yes, private servers, twin amps, you know, you 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 have one that is uh, you know ineffective against physical, ineffective against um, you know magic and what have you. But you know, it seems like some private servers may have got it wrong, but you said it was basically a broken meta with tanking on private servers due to this problem. Is that right? There are other abilities that are where people are missing the values. They were missing values on Thunder Armor is one of the abilities that's supposed to give you a certain amount of threat. Uh, Thunder Fury has three components to it. It has a direct damage proc, the nature damage with the chain lightning. Uh, reduction in nature resistance as an effect. This also had a um, value for how much threat it was supposed to produce. And then there was the attack speed slow. The original version of it, prior to the Thunder Fury's nerf, had a value in it. But when Thunder Fury was brought in line with all the other attack speed reduction effects, when it was normalized because you could stack them up previously, they were missing that entry. And all of a sudden, Thunder Fury was threat spiking like crazy again with defensive stance multiplier. This was also fixed in the 2.0 patches. True to Blizzard's nature, first they're fixing abilities, and then they were fixing items. Battle Shard was the first to go with the pre-patch, and a couple of weeks later, Thunder Fury also got the axe to it. And the main difference that I've noticed from your interviews with private server players is that they all consider Thunder Fury to be a dangerous weapon in the hands of a rogue or an off-warrior due to the amount of threat it, can, it generates. That basically implies that the threat amount is baked into the ability now instead of being just active when the threat modifier for defensive stance is there. That's something that's definitely changing the meta for the general gameplay in raid PvE. And that wasn't the only point that you raised about warriors and your issues with some of the things that private servers have shown. And the next point you raised was kind of a, an issue with warrior rage normalization. And you suggested that, again, private servers got the formula a little bit wrong. And this was one where you started crunching the numbers for me and may, made, I have to admit, a lot of it <laughs> flew over my head. But I guarantee you there'll be people listening to this podcast that will understand. So please, go go nuts. Go as, as, as nitty-gritty as you'd the, like. What was the problem there? The good thing is that we know certain of the formulas because back in those days, the devs were much more open to address the concerns of players. 
when Burning Crusade was announced, we were getting the first changes in the so-called threat normalization. Patch notes people read here. Yeah, it's not that much, that much of a big deal. You're getting 10 or 15 percent more rage, but that's when you are playing solo, when you get hit by enemies, because that's also a major factor on how warriors produce rage. In fights when you're not getting damage, when you're not taking damage, when you're not getting hit, it's only up to how much damage you deal. That's the main part of the formula. For level 60 is the reference value. Don't have it at the head of my top of my head right now. Give me a second. It was 230 damage divided as a damage done divided by 230 and then times 7.5 was the amount of uh, rage that you would produce. You can look this up in the old lane times with the Pratt videos. A warrior that gets ignored by another warrior is just hitting on plate with full rank 14 gear. Takes three auto attack swings before they can use a mortal strike because they produce so just so few amount of rage points per hit. Burning Crusade with the pre-patch changed it that you would always get a, bit, a little bit of beneficial rage whenever you were hitting something, regardless of what, how much damage you would eat. And this has a massive impact on dual wielding, because your offhand in dual wielding, um, first of all, the moment you equip two weapons in World of Warcraft, you get a massive hit deeper for your auto. Not for your styles, not for the main hands like Sinister Strike and Heroic Strikes and things that you're doing as skills on your class, just the auto attacks. The second part is that offhand hits have baseline 50% less damage. And for a warrior, that means that the offhand was basically not producing any rage anymore. It was one or two rage per hit, and even with the best weapons, you may be able to get it up to three or four rage. With the changed formula, you would still get that amount of rage, plus a flat bonus, because you were swinging that offhand weapon. And in extreme cases, when you're hitting targets with a lot of armor, you could get spikes of 90 or 150% more rage from such a hit. Especially in the early days when warriors don't have that much power behind their hits, when they're lacking strength, when they're lacking attack power, when they don't have access to world buffs like the way it's common in private servers, their damage output isn't that high, especially when dual wielding. That's why players were, were back in the days gravitating towards expertise and two-handed weapons and crit instead of dual wielding and hit. It's not just that we were all stupid, it was part way because the gear was not available to make it a feasible playstyle. Now, on that dual wielding thing, one thing I'll ask is because I've seen, you know, in the last couple of months, I've tripped upon, and I know it's been around for a while, but I've tripped upon um, just myself these private server elite guilds that are really trying to push forward this notion of dual wield tanking. And that's become somewhat of the meta recently on private servers. Now, are you suggesting that that's all well and good? Sure, it might work on private servers, but in vanilla, dual wielding might be more of an issue. That depends on two things. The first thing is how high the tank damage is. As a, and that means the incoming damage on the tank. If you're lacking a shield, you're lacking a lot of armor, you're taking bigger hits. If your raid can compensate this with healers, that's another story. It's also the question as to whether or not you want to bring an additional healer for your raid just to compensate for the t damage that your tank may take. But other abilities were producing a huge threat spike back in those days. The release version of the Shield Slam ability was pathetic weak. It was expensive, it was producing barely any rage, and players were basically scuffing at deep prod warriors because it was not really very useful. But Shield Slam and the deep prod talents were buffed several times, and especially Shield Slam has one core element to it that, as far as I'm aware, people who are coded private service can correct me if they've taken this into consideration, is the purge effect of Shield Slam has a threat modifier on it, and this doesn't matter whether the target has a buff active or not. Shield Slam was producing huge threat spikes. And even more so when an actual magic buff was active, 
that the shield slam could remove. Um, for the audience, this should probably be something that we should explain. Shield slam is the 31 points talent in the Pro Tree for Warriors, and it has a 50% chance to remove one magic buff from the target. But this purge effect, this dispel effect, rolls every time you're hitting, regardless whether the buff is there or not. That's something that has to be taken into consideration, because if you're missing that, you're missing a lot of threat that this ability is also supposed to produce. Okay. Now, I mean, obviously, it sounds like you've spent a lot of time with Warriors, and that's quite an in-depth explanation of a few things that you've noticed. But you also brought up the topic of Warlocks, and I wanted to ask you about that next, because you actually suggested, well, not suggested, you said that you started playing WoW as a Warlock, and it sounds like you may have moved on to Warriors later on, but you talked about the fact that Warlocks were quite OP in your mind at the start of WoW, and and again, I'd be intrigued to hear about this one. I, I can't remember what I've heard, but I was of the... I thought that Warlocks... Um, I can't remember if I'd heard that they weren't super duper strong at the start and got better luck. I know everyone says 1.12 warlocks are fantastic. I honestly don't they are remember scaling very well with later equipment. That's a very core feature of them in yes. many expansions. Yes. Um, but I can't remember how they were characterized at the start. I thought they had been described as being relatively average at the start of WoW, but that seems to be different from what you're saying. You played one. You're saying that uh, warlocks were quite OP at the start, and you talked about this concept of negative resistance that we haven't heard yet on the show, so why don't I get you started on that? In the original version of the game, your resistance value could go below zero. It was later changed to be kept at zero, because it was breaking the resistance formula whenever you would go below zero resistance. And warlocks had easy access to this feature with Curse of Elements and Curse of Shadows, both reducing the resistance in Shadow and Fire Frost, respectively. This is also one thing that su surprised me a little bit when you had your interview with Mute, because I was always under the assumption that Mute and Kishkimen knew about this because they were mocking uh, Drake Dog's videos about it. Um, the thing about Drake Dog's PvP videos is that he has deliberately edited all huge crit spikes. The minimum dice rolls that you see that he did not remove because they were happening so frequently is just the plus 75% more damage as non-crits. His destruction spec, his crit should deal 100% more damage, but his shadow bolts can hit with supposed damage of 600 for 1000 just because he was rolling on the negative shadow resistance table. And this was completely broken. Level 48 characters could hit for five, four to 5,000 damage with abilities without any form of spell power on their equipment. Just a crit and negative resistances. The reason why mages were not experiencing that in Molten Core is that frost spells in the original game were binary. Um, that means Frost spells could not have partial resists on them. They could only hit or not hit. That was the original design of them. Later, when the resistances were reworked, could no longer go below zero. Frost got partial resist. Holy got partial resist. The Warlock were missing quite a lot of damage and were sort of weak support characters in Molten Core and Blackwing Lair until they were piling up equipment again, AQ and... Naxxramas in the respective later patches. There's also the other aspect that I've briefly mentioned. Um, attack power slows could stack. That was a part of how players have exploited boss fights. And you've recently had another talk with Kevin Jordan about uh, one of your uh, regulars from the show. Sorry, the name eludes me right now. Is asking about the Doom Guards Cripple. Mm -hmm. The Doom God's crippling effect did stack with Thunderclap, with Thunder Fury, and with Hurricane. You could bring bosses like Golemak down to only hit your tank every three seconds. Hence why Blizzard went ahead and said, okay, attack speed slows or are getting all normalized. None of it stacks anymore. And then they forgot about Thunder Fury and had to fix that in two patches later. <laughs> but that's a different story. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Now, mate, the the last topic I wanted to take you to that you brought up with me, we brought up a few more, but just to fit into this call, is something that I feel 
whether or not listeners feel this one's a little bit controversial, but I really wanted to get your take on this because you, you explained it briefly in the call and I'll let you flesh it out a bit more now, but you talked about the fact that it's funny that people have just accepted that engineering is just, you know, the must have profession, particularly for PVP, given, you know, the things that you can create through that. But you said that there seems to be an item that people often forget about that could arguably give you just as much of an output and uh, I'd let you sort of bring that argument forth and give people some food for thought. That's, um, it was a, a relatively boring and expensive in the first stages with patch 1.3, because it has redesigned the quest rewards for the pylons in Angoro Crater. You have three pylons there, and you can get different buffs or debuff items from it. While this patch also nerfed the crystal yield to no longer stack with Thunder Armor, the other effect that's really beneficial for raiding was the Crystal Charge. Crystal Charge is an item that deals the same average damage like a Dark Iron Bomb, the highest damaging grenade if you don't count the Arcane Bombs, which basically just burn mana and deal no damage if the target doesn't have any mana. It has the same cooldown. It has the same average damage. It's only missing the Incapacitate uh, element. And it has less cast range. But in terms of rate DPS, it's basically chicken feet cheap and easy to get for basically any class, and you don't need engineering for it. The other benefit is that it's instant, so it doesn't delay cast. It doesn't prevent your melee attacks from coming out while you're casting the bomb. It's arguably for a lot of classes even better. It's just missing some AoE range for it. Uh, okay, so maybe I've characterized that wrong. Are you suggesting that it's a perfectly uh, fine alternative for PvE content, but perhaps for PvP engineering could PvP, still be... PvP, you're missing, you're, you're missing the crowd control aspect of it, so obviously that's a big deal why people even downgrade just to use iron grenades. So it's extremely cheap to make. People primarily take them for the crowd control effects. The damages are nice to have, usually. Don't know if this has changed in private service. Right. And the big thing that you're missing for PvE are separate charges, but those are on a five minute cooldown. They're on nice AoE burst. It's basically, it gives every class with engineering the option to use a major's blast wave. So damage is pretty much equivalent to that. But even then, there is a downside. This ability, this item can backfire, and <laughs> that's. Same thing with all old engineering parts. Right, and right. Vanilla engineering has some risks attached to it. So basically, for you know raiders, if you have been hearing and hearing that uh, engineering is a must-have for that you know absolute uh, best output in PVE DPS, there is an alternative that you know you don't necessarily have to you know feel bullied to go engineering. There is another option out there in these crystal charges. Is that kind of the long and short of it? Practically, yes, that's, that's the case. Okay. It's DPS neutral to our Dark Iron Bombs and for free. Plus, if you just pick up all the other crystals while you're running around in Angora, you get the buff items for Spirit, and your raid uh, support classes will always be happy for a free additional Spirit buff from you. Now, Sarah, just before I let you go, you did mention just before we started the recording that you had an interesting note for me about my choice of going with Shadow Priest in vanilla. So you've teased me and now I want to hear it. What did you want to let me know about the uh, the Shadow Priest in vanilla World of Warcraft? The main problem of Shadow Priest's boomkins and elemental shamans in classic World of Warcraft or in vanilla World of Warcraft is that they're going out of mana super fast. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the main problem why they can't DPS on long fights. Now, there is one change that Blizzard made during Burning Crusades to fix something that players could also abuse in classic. Stands to question if they will fix it if it's made public like this, but... In theory, they shouldn't, as it was a part of vanilla World of Warcraft. Uh -huh. Now, in Burning Crusade, Blizzard has went, went back to change three classic potions and flasks. For Gruul, they've changed the potions of invulnerability and flask of petrifications, because you could cheese the raid encounter with it. You could just negate his damage. But several weeks later, with the release of Bur with 
the release of the Black Temple, they've went back to change flasks of distilled wisdom. A very unpopular flask among the classic players, I know. It was changed to give you plus int, int instead of plus max mana. And for people playing retail, not uh, classic or private service, if you get a buff for stamina or intelligence, it increases your maximum health and maximum mana. It does not change how much mana or health you currently have. Flask of Distilled Wisdom gives you plus 2,000 max mana and plus 2,000 mana. If you are dry, if you have just 10 mana left and you drink a Flask of Distilled Wisdom, you have 2,010 mana. And you can spend those 2,000 mana, remove the Flask of Distilled Wisdom buff, and drink another Flask of Distilled Wisdom. It's super expensive. It was really cheap in Burning Crusade when the prices for all the classic materials were basically plummeting. So if you're playing the economy again, you could play those specs with infinite mana, or almost infinite mana. It's just up to you and how much money you want to invest into it. So you're saying this is something that would work in 1.12 vanilla? It did work there. It worked and it was still working in Burning Crusade. And it was deliberately changed with 2.1 to prevent this behavior. So it's, it would be a perfect recreation of the old system. And it would be a massive change if it wouldn't work like this. But arguably, it's probably not the intended use for the flask. That's a different topic. <laughs> Fair enough. No worries. Well, look, Sarah, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, I, all of these points that you raised in your, in your email, I'm so glad that you um, explained them a bit further here on this call. I think that there's something that definitely have not been touched on uh, through the podcast. And it's, you know, you're very clearly a very avid theory crafter, and it's great to hear people get so um, in basically detailed in their explanations of little elements of the games that perhaps don't come up in conversation all the time. So thank you so much again for coming on the show. I'm so glad you won that bet. And I, I can't thank you enough for getting in touch with me and, and putting your hand up for this call. It was an honor to be here and I hope people can take the information and make something out of it. All right, it's time for another countdown to Classic Call, and I am so excited to have this guest on the show, someone who I met at BlizzCon last year, and we got along like a house on fire over a million drinks, and we had a great time. Pat Crane, my man from Convert to Raid, how are we? I am doing wonderfully, and I'm and I'm not n nearly as toxic as I was at BlizzCon when I saw you. Oh That's God, sure. weren't those drinks going down <laughs> way too easily in Anaheim? Uh, way too easily, for sure. <laughs> so Pat and I got together with a few people. We met for the first time in November of last year, and as I said, we we had a great time and chatted the night away. And uh, Pat, if you don't know, obviously everyone who listens to Countdown to Classic, you should be aware that Pat is the host of another amazing World of Warcraft podcast. That show is Convert to Raid. And Pat, I'll give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about you real quick, because it's not just Convert to Raid that you are involved with. You're, you're doing a bit of everything, aren't you? Tell people a bit more about you. Uh, well, I do, I do a variety of things. I, I do like a lot of audio and video production on the side of things. I do vi uh, VO stuff, but uh, Convert to Raid is has been my baby for the last what almost eight years now. And we talk mainly about WoW, uh, and now mainly about WoW and classic WoW. And then if there's time, then we throw in the other games as well from Blizzard. So, <laughs> so we'll talk about all the different things. But I've also um, gotten into uh, talking about podcasting a lot and and trying to help people out with that stuff and you know it's just it's uh, yeah, I do what I love you know and, and so. listeners I can't recommend convert to rate enough I know a lot of countdown to classic listeners do still dabble in retail as well they're either you know still doing their mythic rating while waiting for classic or they're checking the the game out every now and again when a new major patch drops please you know in the way that you've enjoyed countdown to classic 
Go and check out Convert to Rate if you haven't already. Pat does an amazing job over there. But Pat, we're here to talk about something that you haven't talked uh, much about in the past because I think you're one of those people that have just kind of been waiting for it to happen. I, like a lot of people, there's no um, criticism of that whatsoever. But Classic is now on the horizon and you got involved in the beta and you've kind of been like, oh yeah, Classic's coming. I guess I'll go check it out. How have you been with it so far? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty wild. Like initially, like right away, as soon as I I found out that I was in the beta, I'm like, on great, I'm gonna stream all of the initial inst- uh, the the starting zones. I'm gonna I'm gonna level up through all the different starting zones, go to level five, and then from there figure out what the hell I'm trying to do, right? And so, uh, and it was it was an amazing. It was like mind blowing going through all of the different starting zones and just saying, Oh my God, I can't, I, I don't remember a time when a hunter started with just an ax, you know, and that's it. You don't have a pet. You don't have a bow. You just, you just have an ax and that's it. It's like, all right, cool. I guess I'm killing boars the old, the old fashioned way, you know, just, <laughs> running around chopping them to death and that's something i wanted to touch on for sure because as i said um you know retail what we call retail that you know world of warcraft is your focus you know classic is something you may have had on the periphery but um you know maybe not devoted much thought to but now that it's here you are playing at the beta and i'd been meaning to ask people for someone who's been so caught up in in the the current version of the game and and you know you're not one of those people who's played private servers for years to get your vanilla fix and what have you what else have you forgotten about the game that was a huge surprise that you went oh fuck yeah that was a thing uh, uh, like everything i mean uh, so i never played in classic i i was a i was a wrath kid so i um so even in wrath there were a lot of different changes that happened uh, including, you know, flight points and all this kind of stuff, you know, going through, I think really what I, what I really went through was I went through Duratar on my, on my, uh, orc shaman. And I forgot that there were zero flight points in Duratar other than Orgrimmar. There are zero flight points. And that is mm-hmm. a problem. That is a real problem <laughs> for me. Um, but, uh, but, and, and also just, original orgrimmar you know i mean the with the bank in the middle and having to go up around the 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 ramp around the little totem pole thing to get to the flight point and i mean just the layout of everything thrall in the in the back in the valley of wisdom and not somewhere in the valley of strength you know it's, it was just kind of all of these different things um the placement of things and and um how grueling it could be well, it's funny because you know at low levels. Anyway. I'm the exact opposite of you because I have barely spent any time playing World of Warcraft, the modern version of the game, for years. And if you dropped me in the middle of Orgrimmar now, and I remember being a little bit confused, you know, when I checked it out for like a week when BFA came out and really didn't do much with it, but. You know, drop me in the middle of Orgrimmar now, and I would be that version of you in Classic, walking around going, what the hell is this place? Like, where <laughs> is everything? So it's funny that there are those two opposing views on the old and the new. But right. uh, the next thing I'd ask you, Pat, is that uh, I think a great thing that's starting to happen now with this beta being open to a lot of people involved in the media, and you were talking about streamers, podcasters, everyone getting involved. Um, you know, it, it is rubbing some people the wrong way that they haven't opened it up a little bit more, and I would agree with that. I wish Blizzard would open it up more, but we're stuck with where we're at. But seeing the members of the media involved is actually getting people talking about classic now on shows that have ordinarily not devoted much time to it. And I'm loving that. Obviously, as you mentioned, you guys on, on convert to Ray devoted an hour to it recently. Other shows I'm seeing popping up. I heard, um, Ro talking about it for an hour the other day on realm, uh, restart and, um, and just seeing more and more podcasts that I know of finally talking about classic and the voices that I love talking about the game that I love. It's really exciting. Whereas, you know, it's been quiet you know um over the last year and a half or so uh yeah and and you know i guess the i guess when you uh especially when you're running a podcast it, seeing is believing right and so that is kind of the main thing is is as soon as you can see it and touch it and kind of uh uh figure out exactly what it's going to look like um it's a lot easier to talk about and we've and we've been talking about classic for a long time about 
uh, kind of the generalities of what classic is. I mean, I know that here on this show, you do deep dives into everything and it's amazing and mind blowing. And, and I feel really dumb sometimes uh, <laughs> just <laughs> listening, you know, it's just, just listening. I'm like, wow, these guys are uber smart. I'm, I'm, I'm so not there. Um, but, uh, but for me, I mean, getting in game and playing around with it and, and just trying to, trying to do the thing, trying to, trying to just play the game. Uh, it's, it can be a little, uh, Arduous, I think, is the uh, proper term. <laughs> now, I, I've probably challenging. <laughs> I've probably, um, you know, put the cart before the horse, and you may have alluded to it, but I should just ask: with what you've done in the beta, have you been having fun? Oh yeah, no, it's so. Uh, I think of it as a separate game because really, it is. You know what I mean? It's. Like today's uh, like BFA right now is um, especially the leveling process is just, you know, you fly by and you're going so fast. You, you don't even know, you can't even look around. You don't even bother anymore. But with classic, you have to spend time figuring out how much bag space you have and uh, you know, what you're going to uh throw away into the desert somewhere because you picked up something else or you, and you don't have the bag space for it or, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, it's a, it's a slower process. You have to look around, you have to notice the world around you. And I think all of those things make it feel bigger. Um, it makes it feel a, a lot more. I, I, and maybe it's just because I've been doing the initial leveling stuff, but I mean, it does feel a little, lonely now that most people are level 40 at this point uh but but it's it feels uh kind of intense <laughs> yeah and, and i really and i actually really enjoy it as in kind of in concert with bfa like bfa will give you one thing it will give you the uh the all the loot and all the all the stuff, every purple you ever can dream of. Yeah, yeah. Let's just give it to you, and then you go into classic, and you're like fighting for greens and and fighting for your life, really. Mm. <laughs> I'm so glad you raised the point that there are times when you felt a little lonely in the beta because that's probably the major criticism that I have it have of it at this point. And as I said earlier, you know, I really, really wish Blizzard would go nuts and open. The, I've been saying it for a few weeks now, like open those gates even further. And I'm not sure if there's a plan, you know, I don't know, two, three weeks before launch or before the end of the beta, I should say, to really open the floodgates and say, all right, everyone, come on in and go nuts. But the one thing that I've noticed is, you know, I... I I have a job, I, you know, have things going on in real life and everything, and I can't devote, you know, all the amount of time that I would love to to this beta, much to my chagrin. But, um, you know, as you say, everyone's racing to 30, they hit level cap straight away and they have all the fun. Then they raise it to 40. Everyone is, I mean, literally 20, it seemed like within 36 hours of that level cap being raised to 40, half of my guild was level 40. And I was like, oh yeah, they're all streamers and they do this full time. I get that. But I'm lagging behind. I dinged level 29 last night. And a lot of these areas I'm going to are really quiet. And it kind of feels, you know, the opposite of what I was hoping from my beta experience in an MMORPG. So it's good to hear that you've seen that. Has it has it turned you off a little bit or, you know, it's like, oh, it's all good. Obviously when the game launches, there'll be plenty of people around. Well, and, yeah. I mean, I think that on initial launch, uh, I'll probably be playing a little bit more than I am now. I, I really don't want to uh, burn myself out on, on classic. And I know that if I went through the leveling process, which is more, it's just more work. It's just plain and simple. It's just more work. Mm -hmm. And so if I have to put in all that work and then restart it, I'm going to maybe feel a little weird about that for, you know, some time a week. I don't know, a couple of days. Uh, so I don't want to necessarily go too hard, too fast in the beta. I just kind of want to hang out and have fun and, and check out some, some little things like, Oh my God, I can't believe that flights to, to hear are one silver and 10 copper. I don't even have that in my, in my uh, bag. So it's like, Oh God, I can't get to the place I want to go. You're dancing uh, for so, dollars on the mailbox to get that flight money. Exactly. So 
I think when we get there, it will be uh, a much more diverse leveling experience for all those people out there. And I, I, we actually, I've been talking about it a lot. And, and I think that I've come up with a plan. And if you're on the same server as me, uh, d- don't use it because I, because I'm, <laughs> I'm planning on using it. So if you're on the same server as me, uh, be looking for the, the nice thing is that we have all this brand new tech that we didn't have back in the day, right? We have discord, we have, uh, social media, all that, all that kind of stuff. What I'm, what I'm proposing is that if you're on a server, maybe start up a discord server for your entire server. And then that way it becomes like trade chat times a million. And, uh, you might be able to find people that are wanting, wanting to do the same thing as you. And I think that that will come in really handy, especially after, let's say a few months into classic, because I think that it'll die down to a lot of the hardcore people. And, and especially if there's new content and BFA there, they might be uh, a little, you know, they want to go back and forth a little bit more. And, and so uh, something like that could be, could be, it could be horrible because it's trade chat, but it could be also very helpful along the way. I have no doubt that that's exactly what's going to be happening. All these server discords will pop up and, and a lot of people will join and it will change the dynamic um, in the way in which we communicate with not only our own faction, but obviously members of the opposite faction can jump in as well and sort of engage there. And whatever pros and cons come of that, you know, it's going to be a thing. But I, I also like, <laughs> I'm a sucker for the kind of drama that it could bring as well because... We talk oh, yeah. about the old server forums and people would jump on there and be like, you know, fuck you, no, fuck you, blah, blah, blah. Now it's instant and you just jump on and go like, hey, I know that's your character. You're an asshole for this reason. You ganked me here. I didn't think that was cool, blah, blah, blah. And not even that, you can just give them a voice call and be like, hey, let's talk about it. Right. You know, it's. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, <laughs> to be honest with you. So we'll see what happens. But um, That would be great. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to give that Pat Crane a call and give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> but um mate you talked about you know that it's more work obviously leveling on classic and you know the, the the game doesn't shy away from that it's quite obvious and you talked about how it is a little bit slower i think it's so great you know hearing that you're a wrath baby if i could give you the opportunity now to speak to your fellow wrath babies who may be listening to the show and if you were to perhaps explain to them should they be apprehensive or not of that more arduous leveling process i mean i think it's a more fun one and some people might agree with me obviously but if you were to tell the wrath babies what they can come to expect of the leveling process and whether or not they should be scared what do you say to them well i think that the, I, I i'm more concerned about the cat of babies myself or and beyond but i think the wrath kids they will they will remember uh the leveling process a little bit, a little bit kind of, it's very similar to classic. Classic is definitely a little bit tougher. I think, I think that the, there were some more flight points put in, in, in uh wrath or maybe it was early Cata. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but uh, I would say to the wrath babies, remember before LFD hit before looking for dungeon, we actually had to work on our servers to, to get together into groups and go tackle the latest content, go to go into the dungeons and stuff like that. And we had to, we had to, we had to actually know the people on our server and it's that type of thing. That's the reason that's the pull that classic has over uh current. Wow. Over, over BFA. It's, it's just that community thing where you actually get to know people on your server both on your side and the opposite side, especially if you go go into battlegrounds or whatever. Uh, so you will get to know the people on your server either by name or in person or by their voice or whatever if you're doing the Discord thing. So I think that it's going to be, I think it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of fun and a lot of interesting times, uh, especially if you're playing on a PvP server. I think it's going to be pretty sweet. 
Mate, what's the plan for you going forward with the show and, you know, you and, and you know, guests or co-hosts in terms of covering classic? And I'm not just talking about Convert to Raid, but sort of what you might guess other podcasters will be doing as well moving forward. We've got this, I, as I, you say, it's a new game coming out and people, are they going to feel compelled to level a character on classic just to be able to talk about it? Or maybe still like, oh, uh, you know, there's other places for people to hear about that. It's going to be a very personal experience, I think. I mean, some people really don't want to play Classic because they played back in the day and they remember how hard it was. And the, and the mages only remember making water for their raid team and, and you know, all of this, all of this different stuff. And, and, and so some people will opt to, to not play. And that's OK. And some podcasts will opt to only talk about uh, the, the latest edition of WoW. Uh, myself, I'm I'm planning on talking about uh classic wow quite a bit i'm also planning on uh talking about current wow quite a bit on the same show and all of the different blizzard games as i as i normally do uh but i also plan on playing to 60 and seeing what that's like and and trying to trying to maybe do some end game stuff at, at that point i i don't know just see where it takes me um but i i i think that there will be something for everybody when when that actually goes live and and we see how the how the different podcasters re- react to it because everybody's going to have their own take right yeah yeah everybody's going to everybody's going to have their own thing and they're going to be like all right i made it to level level 10 and i'm and i'm out of durotar now i quit you know yeah yeah <laughs> you know? yeah i did what i wanted to do man <laughs> i made it to orgrimmar <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, I have the utmost respect for you moving forward because it's going to take a hell of a bit of scheduling to obviously do that journey to 60 in classic whilst also keeping up with the Joneses in the modern game as well. So, I mean, kudos to you, man. You see, I, I know you love gaming. You throw a lot of time into it. I, I, I couldn't do it myself. I, I have, you know, I look up to all these people that can put so much good time into all the games and be able to talk about it at such a high level. So I think you've got a big job ahead of it's, you, but I know you're up to the task. It's all about passion and doing what you love. And, and if you're not, and, and if I'm not liking it, by the time that I hit level 60, guess what? I'll probably say I'm out. I did what I, I intended to do and I'm, I'm going to leave my 60 there and it'll, it'll stay there. But you know, I mean, classic isn't going anywhere. So if you make it to level 60, you're good. Oh, yeah. And I I have no doubt that that is because we've been talking about goals in classic. And I talk about how, you know, this is a chance for a lot of people to do things over. And a lot of people's goals might be, hey, I just want to ding 60 and then I'll tap out. And there's no problem with that whatsoever. I think that's a great thing in and of itself because that is a huge goal to get there. Personally, mine isn't even a huge goal either. I sort of say, as soon as I walk through those big old double doors of molten core which i've never done before i'll consider my classic job complete i won't stop there but that's what i really want to do that's my ultimate goal and you know i think it's good to set an achievable one yeah yeah i mean the the, i and i'm and i'm not really setting any time constraints on it either so uh and i think that that's also important Uh, like i'm saying i want to hit level 60 it might take me some time it might take me a, a couple of months who knows how long it's going to take me, but I plan on, uh, playing as I, uh, playing as I can and, and leveling up and enjoying the experience and take my time and, uh, and really kind of soaking it all in because I never experienced it at this raw of a state for the game. Hmm. Uh, and so might as well just, uh, take my time and enjoy all the bugs that aren't bugs. Absolutely. Now, mate, real quick, as we wind up, uh, we'll have to talk uh, BlizzCon this year. You going? Oh yeah. All right. Are you? I I, I am. What are we drinking? Uh, well, I'll be drinking a variety of beers and bourbons, probably. And I uh, will. I'll I'll be right there with you on the hard stuff, mate. Right. So we'll we'll have All to right. do a uh, a reenactment of last year's get together and get even. You got it. Get even worse this time around. I uh, I very much so enjoyed that party over at the Marriott done done and done (laughs) and um I'll I'll have to say good day to Thist as well I know Thist is over here at the moment in Australia and I I I, she's a busy busy bee over here doing the MDI so I don't think I'm going to get a chance to uh say good day or anything but I'll hit her we'll we'll all have a uh get together at BlizzCon for sure absolutely see you there 
All right, mate. Pat, thanks so much again for coming on the show. One more time, please throw out a big plug for uh, what you do over there at Convert to Raid and what might be coming up on the show for everyone. Oh, boy. Well, uh, we're over at ConvertToRaid.com if you want to see all the shows and all the videos and the audios and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, coming up on the show is, is going to be more, I mean, we basically do all the gaming news uh, for all the different Blizzard games. So if it makes sense to uh, throw it in there, I, I think we'll throw it in there. I'm sure that we'll be talking a lot about uh, patch 8.2 that's coming up for uh, BFA and also uh, the latest shenanigans in uh, the classic beta because it is so fun watching all these different streamers and stuff um, causing problems. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, mate, look, thanks so much for coming on. We've been meaning to do this for a long time, and it's so great to have you on the show. Um, you know, everyone, please, I'll double down on what Pat has said. Go on over, check out Convert to Raid. I can't recommend it enough. Pat does an amazing job over there. If not, just go for that sultry voice and that amazing audio setup that I'm so envious of, Pat. I just <laughs> Every time I hear you on Convert to Raid, I hear your voice. I'm just like, oh, my God, it just sounds like the world's slickest soundproof booth. And Dude. oh. Dude, you have you have one of the best voices ever. Come on, Come I, I, on. You, I just get by. I just get by on this Australian thing. So you know, I'm coasting. That's true. That's that's <laughs> probably that's probably about. Uh, that's got to be at least fifty percent of it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, mate. We'll look. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Josh. And that's the show for today, everyone. But be sure to listen in next week as we'll have more classic chat for you then. So please keep tuning in for more Countdown to Classic. But before you go, let's have some fun and see if we can get through all these thank yous in one breath as we try to do here on the show. I've been limbering up. I'll take a deep breath and see if we can get a bit further than I usually do. Here we go with a thank you to the following patrons. <sighs> Eight Count, Aero PC, Anti, Bear of Pain, Binger, Brandon K, Bubba, Callum F, Chunky Dunk, CJ, Connor C, Damian A, David F, David J, Duffikus, Flame Off, Gecko Mayhem, Halsey Spartan, Henrik B, Hurlbert, James S, Jamie S, John H C, Josh W, K Sir 37, Minoru, Patrick J, Randall H, Rasmus S, Rarebit, Rick S, Ryan K, Sylvia K, Stop, I always get to this point. I'll start back from a couple. Ryan K, Sylvia K, Stov, Tim B, Tim S, Tom S, Twigs, and Zudamos. And of course, the very dedicated, legendary patrons of Countdown to Classic, an extra special shout out and thank you from the bottom of my heart to those who dig very deep for the show every month in Batlord, Billy C, Eric S, Fire Spittin' Kitten, Flozy B, Freaky Fritz, Galgamir, Goat Rope, Ida B, Carl W, Nick D, Palfurus, Sira S, Tsunami, The Anton, Wilson Ma, Vanifak, and Balako. Thank you so much for your phenomenal support of the show. Countdown to Classic would not be on the air without your support. So that's it for today, everyone. Have a great rest of the week, and I will see you all next time.